Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 239. Thanks so much for joining me. Today's guest is Doug Ramspeck. He'll be here in about five minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do all this because we love poetry and I know you do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell. Leave reviews. Uh, whatever you can do to help spread poetry around the internet would be much appreciated. Um, now, we always like to start with a poet respond poem. And today's poet, uh, Sunday's poet, I should say, couldn't be here. Um, but we are going to take a look at Exodus 1521. An um, interesting poem about a story I've heard some glimmerings of, but didn't really know a whole lot about what's been going on. I have a few friends who are teachers, and they've been talking about this kind of thing for a while. But here's what Miguel had to say about, um, about the new story he came across this week. Oh, here you go. This is um, Miguel Barreto Garcia. And he says, I wrote this poem as a form of response to the problem of chronic absenteeism in U.S. schools. Currently, the student absences have only exacerbated since the pandemic. I feel like there is more to the story. The pandemic not only affected children's relationships with schools, but it also affected the way families have to navigate through the frictions in the workforce. Post-pandemic, parents also suffer from anxieties and work-related imposter syndrome in ways which are similar or even more concerning. In, this, in several cases, it's the children that end up buffering the internal struggles that parents have to deal with, and in some instances, they end up stepping up to the role of parent and consequently foregoing their education. This is a dim, uh, dimension of post-pandemic life that I wanted to explore through this poem. And um, this article here uh, for the New York Times that he was talking about, and here's his poem. It's a beautiful one about an important topic, Exodus 1521 by Miguel Barreto Garcia. Exodus 1521. There are pages of homework left open on the table, the way there are plenty of leftovers in the fridge. Here I am, left on the fringes, this desolate place I call home. The TV at some point started to hiss. No more reality show kissing scenes. No more breaking news. Reality is white noise with a white dress dancing to a poltergeist. Kitchen cabinets stocked with bottles of prescriptions. White tablets of antacids for upset stomachs. Light blue sertraline pills for the nerves. In the morning... I break the fast. All I know that something is broken. The yellow bus no longer passes by my street. My teacher keeps calling our landline, but my mother is wearing thick black headphones, canceling all her appointments, including motherhood. I crack the egg and whisk it until my mother stops breaking down. I learned how to change the oil of our car, but I'm still figuring the ways to keep the ballerina figurines from falling onto the hardwood floor. Our house leaves no secrets, and our house has plenty of them. All of them demons in the freezer waiting for the day the social worker to knock on our door and take me to another version of hell. I do have faith in our protective services, just as I have faith in the God Moses prayed to. The last time I was in Sunday school, the needle screeched on the turntable and the living room was the sound of old 50s Hollywood. My father used to be a happy man. My father used to be alive. When he checked out from this world, I checked out the cold silence of my mother's bed. Death sleeps beside my mother the way a child clings to their mother to the sound of thunder. My mother is the child. 
Nothing in our textbooks prepared me to mother my mother. Nothing is the mother I bring close to my milkless bosom. Here I sing to the Lord America's requiem. Here I hold her close as if we were no longer the parted sea. A great poem there. That was uh, Miguel Barreto Garcia with uh, Sunday's poem, um, Exodus fifteen twenty one. And Miguel is at work right now. Was hoping to step out, but obviously couldn't make it. Um, but great poem and great to be able to share that with everybody today. Now we're gonna take a quick break and go to our main guest, uh, Doug Ramsbeck. It's here, so sit tight, and I'll be right back with more poetry. <laughs> And we're back. Uh, like I said, today's guest is Doug Ramsbeck. Doug is the author of nine collections of poetry, one collection of short stories, and a novella. His recent books include Blur, winner of the Tenth Gate Prize, a Book of Years, Under Black Leaves, Black Flowers, and The Owl That Carries Us Away, winner of the G.S. Sherat Chandra Prize for short fiction. He's three-time recipient of the Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award, and he's recently retired and moved to Black Mountain, North Carolina. And here he is, uh, Doug Ramsbeck. Hey, Doug, how you doing? Good, good. Thank you very much for inviting me in. Yeah, it's definitely, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, you know, I've been a fan of your work. You've been in Rattle just sort of regularly for years um, with really great poems that have a lot of atmospheric mood to them, I think. There's some sort of narrative-based poetry with a sort of a, emotional landscape going on and it's really fascinating uh, it's really cool to explore that a little more deeply today i look forward to it well let's start out uh, with the first poem what do you want to read first uh it's a poem from the book original bodies and the poem is entitled economics and as you mentioned uh, uh, a lot of my poems really are narrative poems i, I think of them as story poems economics it was a form of weakness, my father said, an embarrassment. The men after the war who were hollowed out were grass in the field behind the house. Men who slept amid the shadows of their days, who existed like cigarette smoke, idle and drifting, and shuddered at backfiring pickups and saw their life's labor as a stroll to the mailbox for the government check. When I was 12, my father returned from a trip to Chicago with 500 off-brand batteries purchased on the cheap from a company going out of business. And so I was sent on my bicycle to the farmhouses and clusters of neighborhoods in our small Ohio town. There was something holy in labor, my father believed. But what I remember is how discouraging it felt to ask strangers again and again to reach into their pockets for cash they didn't have. Sometimes the old women or men who opened the doors eyed me the way the moon eyes the earth the way the clouds are part of the sky, but also separate from it. Then in college, I worked one summer on mosquito abatement, and my primary job was to step from the truck to the road's verge and count how many mosquitoes bit me in a minute. I was a poor man, St. Francis of Assisi, but my father was impressed by the work ethic evident in the manifold bumps on my arms and legs, impressed the way he never was with my meager sales of the batteries that mostly still remained in a cardboard box in his garage during the final years of his life, 
when I would find him sitting on the couch with a television blaring the same cycle of news over and over. There was a stillness about him then, a smallness, as though the grass had grown up around him in great empty stalks. The years and the sun had freckled his hands with dark splotches, and often he seemed to be studying their hieroglyphics, pondering what the slow decades had wrought, and his unshaven face was listless as the clouds. The days blurred together after that, were like the fallen oak by the fence, hollowed at the middle and spilling its dark salt. My father had little, if anything, to say, though he did tell me one early morning that he imagined the advantage of being dead was that the living would finally leave you be. Yeah, and that was um, Economics, uh, the first poem here by Doug Ramsbeck. Thanks for sharing that, Doug. And you mentioned uh, right away something I was interested in. I know I, you know, you've published a book of fiction um, and short stories, a novella. Um, why? And you write narrative poems. So what are the differences between the two? Um, why do you choose to write predominantly in poems? And then how do you know, you know which is which? Uh, a lot of this happened. My MFA back in the late 70s was in fiction. And um, I always imagined I was going to want to write short stories and novels and things of that sort. Uh, then that was in my upper 20s. And between then and the time I turned 50, I suffered from just horrible writer's block, the worst you can imagine. I would write the begin. I would write the page of a short story, read it aloud and think to myself, that's awful and stop. Hmm. Or I'd write the, the first page of a novel and think that's no good and stop. And this happened year after year after year after year. When I turned 50 and it was really all in a single day, I thought to myself, you know, if I, if I write poems, I can stop after that page and call it done. Um, and that's why I, I began writing poetry. And it really made all the difference. Um, so I really came to the writing of poetry thinking as a storyteller, as a fiction writer, but doing it in the form of poetry. And so to, <clears throat> when you say how I switch back and forth, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't see a whole lot of difference between the two. I'm sort of thinking about them the same way as I've had some works that I've called poems that I've also then decided to call fiction at other times. So I, I don't see a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's really interesting to start with. So tell us more about that. Um, ha having that 30 year gap of not writing poems. Um, what do you think the, the, well, let's go back a little bit farther first. So, so why did you want to write poems in the first place? Um, and then, and then because of that, why would you stop? <laughs> so, well, I, you know, again, I, I, I was planning to write fiction at first, and I, I even had a short story. This is back when Seventeen used to publish short stories a long time ago. Um, and I had a story published there. I was contacted by an agent wanting me to write a, a YA book, and this was all in my late 20s. And at that point, though, I just started, I moved into, I think the worst kind of writer's block where what I would do is I would read aloud, I would write something and then read aloud and a novel or a short story I loved and then compare the two and mm -hmm. tell myself mine isn't as good as that and okay. stop. And so, and then I, I got busy doing other things. I got busy, busy teaching, you know, having family, things of that sort. So other things got in the way. But I, I think when I went to poetry, it really was a kind of a release for me, not only just because I could stop after a page and call it done, but because I changed the way I wrote completely. I, I tried to move from being a very conscious writer thinking things out very carefully to being exactly the opposite to making it as unconscious as possible to imagine i wasn't writing it i was just listening um mm -hmm. to voices and letting letting the poems write themselves and so it wasn't just switching to poetry it was changing how i did it too mm -hmm. yeah i mean that self-consciousness sets in and is is really makes it difficult to be creative at all um, do you, was there, so, so the success, was it the success of the fiction at first having, you know, an agent and things like that interested, uh, that, that made you self-conscious? I mean, I assume there was a time where, um, you loved writing for the joy of it and unselfconsciously, and then you maybe became self-conscious over time with, is that the case? Right. I, you know, I, I, I had a bad MFA experience. I think that was, was part of it. And I, I, but for me, I really think it came down to the more, and this is part of the MFA, not that I think they did anything wrong or that it's not MFA isn't wonderful for some people, 
But for me, it made it a very much a, a conscious event where you write something and then you have the autopsy about it. And that autopsy was not helpful for me because it just turned off that creative part, the opening up to it and began thinking about it as something you, you created stitch by stitch, piece by piece, as opposed to where you listen. So I think what a lot of what happened was I, as you say, when I first began writing, I wrote for the joy of it. I wrote very quickly. I didn't think about it a lot. Things just poured out of me. By the time I had my MFA, I was writing very slowly in a tortured fashion and, and thinking about every sentence as I wrote it and evaluating that sentence in the moment of writing it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting that, you know, that that's come up so fast because just a couple weeks ago we had Raymond Hammond on uh, who um, he wrote that book, uh, Poetic Amusement. And it's basically about how much damage MFA programs do by making it a music or, you know, without the muse, by not having it be through that flow. Um, you know, his argument was that, um, you know, we, we taught we have all these tools that we can teach. They're teachable. And so once we focus on that, we lose that sort of spontaneous passion and it sort of sucks it out. Do you think do, do you think it's the MFA's fault, really, in the same way that he did? I, I think it depends. I do think that there, there are things that can be useful about being self-conscious about writing. I, I think you have to develop both parts. You do have to learn to, I think you need to read a lot. You need to begin to develop sort of an aesthetic. And so I think a lot of these things can be very useful in MFA program. My own feeling is that too often they're focusing, though, on the conscious part, on the intellectual part, and not focusing enough on the creative part. And I, I think you need them both. They need to develop in unison rather than just, if one gets so much, it's like a, if one gets so much more powerful than the other, I think that can be damaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's just so interesting to hear you say that, because I think that was the exact argument that Raymond was making in that book, <laughs> Poetic Amusement, that we have to find a way to, um, you know, bring that side back, the creative side, you know, and, and while also appreciating the technical side, but you can't have that much imbalance. You have to have both going at the same time. Um, well, let's hear another poem, and then we'll, we'll talk some more. I think this one fits really well. Sacred music is next, which, um, uh, you know, a bit of a, the sacred music is what we're talking about. So that's a good one to read. Sacred music. This wind wailing across a carapace of snow is bitter and uncertain. A small god of gray light weeping at the edges of railroad tracks. Gus rattling windows, cold air seeping into fissures like the sudden startled intake of breath. I heard last July when a young girl, perhaps 14, dressed in summer shorts, a t-shirt and flip-flops, stepped through the wrong door at the YMCA and witnessed five aging men, none with towels, our bodies primitive with years, mud thick around our bellies, our hair decaying gray or white, knobs between our legs, so fled, or crows calling in dark voices from the yard when my cousin, both of us not yet nine, began thrashing on the grass with her first seizure, as though trying to free herself from the constraints and burdens of the body. Yeah, so that's a great poem. You can feel the rhythm of the storytelling and how sort of spontaneous and free it is coming out. Um, can you explain your writing process a, a little bit? So you... Um, you know, with a with fiction, you are sort of being stopped up after one page. Um, you know, is this sort of a one continuous chunk that you wrote it in? Is, it, is that how it works for you, where you sit down and get in that zone where you're being unconscious and push forward with the storytelling? Uh, there are a number of things that I try to do in order to try to turn off my conscious mind. I'm convinced that, that as a conscious writer, I'm no good. But when I listen and if i'm just listening i'm an, a, a, not a bad listener and that's what i try to do i try to set up situations where i'm listening to what the poem is saying and not what uh, i'm trying to create so i will use various techniques to try to avoid it being conscious i like for example to start oftentimes with a title first um, um and then i try to make sure that oftentimes that the when the poem opens it has nothing to do that i know at least with the title and so that part of the writing becomes, how am I going to eventually get to that title making sense? So it becomes a process of discovery in the writing. Another technique I like to use is to write four poems very quickly, as far as I can tell, that have nothing to do with each other, and then try to take the best lines out of them, and then try to stitch those into a coherent poem. So for me, I'm always trying to break down the conscious part of it, break down the decision-making process and pushing that aside and having it just be things that I that I see or hear or that present themselves to me as I'm writing. 
Yeah, well, that's fascinating. That's two really interesting techniques separately. So, so if you're coming up with a title that has nothing to do with the beginning of the poem, how do you come up with the title then? Um, is it arbitrary? Is it some spontaneous? I mean, how do you how do you find a title if you, you're trying not to match the content? That's really interesting. I, I, I'm looking for a certain kind of sound. I think I am interested in animism. I'm interested in sort of, and so I'm looking for a title that has that sound to me. And I think I also do it sometimes by opening a book at random and looking for a word and then looking look at that word and think, well, how can I pair that with another word that I find interesting? And so just find it. I'm just trying to stitch together words that evoke for me some kind of feeling of interest that it just some kind of, where, I, where I hear the title and I go, oh, that sounds interesting to me. I want to write that and sort of see see why that is a title. Well, that's really fascinating. Do you think that it's your subconscious trying to tell you the title? Like, do you think you have something there already that, that's helping reveal? Or do you think it's forming something new as you write toward the title? Like, do you think it's sort of preconceived subconsciously? I don't know how you could tell the difference, but, but do you think so? I, I think of, I used to use a technique sometimes with, with students in the, in the classroom where if you ask them, can you come up with an, a really good metaphor for love? You just can't do that when somebody asks you to do that. It's just, it's just the, the conscious part of that makes it almost impossible to come up with anything that's any good. You just incline yourself towards cliches. If instead you say, write a lot of, write a bunch of images about a field or something, or, or and you give them, or you show them a painting and say, now write the images that you see in this. And then you say when they're done, now use those images to come up with an image for, for love, a metaphor for love, then you can do it. Um, because it's suggesting itself to you. So I, I don't think I have an idea when I'm writing the title. I think that the, the title gives me the ideas of what to say. So it's sort of the opposite. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's really interesting. And then the other one, too, you know, writing four poems quickly and then combining the best lines into one poem. I mean, both of those seem to be, um, as Katie Dozier in the comments said, uh, they're flow state hacks, <laughs> you know, ways to get into the flow state, um, you know, by letting your um, your subconscious come to the fore. So if you have something that you're sort of grappling with subconsciously, um, and then you're writing four quick poems, they're all different ways maybe of tackling that thing that you were thinking about without realizing it, like, you know, that some emotional spark or whatever that was drawing you toward that topic. So you're writing it from all these different directions and then it ends up in the, it, it fits together at the end. I think that's really, that's really interesting. Do you, do you think that's how it works? I do. And, and I don't think that I'm, and it, it sounds odd, I think, to say because I don't. My, my poems aren't experimental, particularly. My poems aren't sort of odd poems, the kind of poems you think of someone like Jory Graham with these sort of wild flights in every direction. But that, but so they often do sort of have a coherent narrative. But I get to that narrative, coherent narrative, I think, through those techniques. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And so, so how much um, is truth? How much is actual memory and how much is fiction as you sort of conjure narratives through these processes? Um, is it is it mostly stuff that I, like the first poem, um, economics, um, was that mostly true? I mean, did you, um, you know, did you stand there waiting, the, waiting for the mosquitoes to bite you? Or is that um, something that came up from a fiction kind of mode? It's mostly fiction. Um, I actually knew someone who worked in mosquito abatement when we were in college. And so, and some of that is sort of based on things he would talk about, but it wasn't something that happened with me. Um, the only connection between the father in that poem and my own father was that both are kind, were kind of difficult. Um, but, but the actual events were things that were fictionalized, that were made up. And again, I think that partly came from my imagining the writing of short stories that I was sort of creating things. And when I'm writing poems, I'm often creating things. I do think they reflect things that I felt, things that I've experienced, but the events themselves are usually made up. Yeah, I mean, I like to make the distinction between facts and truth. You know, truth or something deeper than facts. And, you know, facts that aren't true can get you closer to truth, which is the great irony of fiction, really. Um, and so it's interesting to hear sort of fiction principles playing themselves out in poetry. Um, well, let's read another poem. Um, next, we have uh, Snow Crow. And this is a prose poem, so we can maybe feel a bit of that, too. And it was actually published as flash fictions. Ah. Snow Crow. And the days were made of auguries, and the cricket calls arrived disembodied from the field, 
and a dead mole lay on its back by the garage, gathering its thin blanket of ants, and wasps hummed outside the boy's window like primitive wraiths. And one morning he found a dead crow in the woods and carried it back to the house, hiding it at the back of his closet like a reliquary. And sometimes he imagined the creatures calling to him in the night, calling to him in his dreams, and the boy would rise, pull the string for the closet light, and open the cardboard box. And there was the crow, its dark wings motionless, its dark and lacquered eyes gazing up at him. And sometimes in the mornings the boy stepped into the backyard and gazed at the sun with its raw, sepulchral eye. And at breakfast now and then he asked about his father, and his mother would cross her arms over her chest or set his plate so forcefully on the table that the boy would look away. And some afternoons he sat in his closet and imagined the crow lifting itself on the dark oars of its wings, rowing high above the trees, or the boy imagined a crow call fissuring the air, a crow call that was both corporeal and incorporeal at once. And the smell in the boy's closet was like something secretive congealing on the surface of a pond, and on the evening when a first light snow of the season came dropping toward the land, the boy carried the crow back into the woods and tossed it as high as he could manage into the air. And that was Snow Crow by Doug Ramsbeck. And uh, Doug, so you mentioned that that was published as flash fiction. Um, what do you do? You think there's a difference between flash fiction and prose poetry? Um, is there any distinction at all? I do think you can see some flash fiction stories where you, you oftentimes think of poetry as being sort of some kind of elevated language. And I do think you can read some flash fiction stories where the language is not particularly elevated. And those can be, you know, very successful, you know, very interesting stories. So I do think it where you run, but I do think prose poems you think of are some kind of combination of the more straightforward language, perhaps, or prose-like language combined with maybe some lyrical or poetic flourishes. And so, I, but I do think poetry and flash fiction have a lot of, can contain a lot of different kinds of writing within them. And so I do think that I honestly could easily imagine taking that poem and of putting it in lines and sending it out and try to get it published as a poem. I think that it could have, I could have, I could have tried that either way. And I don't think anyone would have said, oh, no, you can't do that. That's not a poem or that's not a flash fiction story. So, so why for this? Um, why prose and not breaking it out into the narrative? Um, it wouldn't be that different, like you mentioned. I mean, if we'll see a few poems later that are longer lines sort of without, you know, individual couplets or stanzas, um, and it could very easily be that with just a few line breaks. So what was the difference? What drove you in this one to make it prose? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, I, I went through a period when I was interested in writing flash fiction. So I think a lot of it was just moving back and forth between sometimes writing poetry, sometimes flash fiction. And I do think sometimes it was very similar material that I would write in the flash fiction and in the poems. And again, I think a lot of times because I'm trying to give over some of these decision making process, the process of it, I'm not really deciding all that consciously whether I'm wanting to write a prose poem or wanting to write a flash fiction piece or wanting to write a, um, I just think it, I just sort of, whatever sort of occurs to me, whatever, how whatever starts coming out, I just go with it. I tend to try to trust what's coming out rather than trying to second guess it. Hmm. Do you remember the, the first time you realized you wanted to be a writer? Was there was there some incident that happened or something you wrote that surprised yourself or anything like that? I was one of those very reluctant readers when I was young. The My idea of torture as a kid would have been to make me read something. Um, I thought reading was just awful. And I think that um, it really didn't, not until I hit high school, that I actually suddenly began to get interested in in reading and a lot of it was reading mystery novels and I think that's what first brought me to the idea of reading and I don't think it was until I got to college that I began to expand that outward to being really interested in literary writing um, and that was from partly from taking classes but in terms of the writing I first became interested and in, I know it didn't work out this way at first but I first began writing poetry when I was um, in maybe eighth grade night and freshman of high school. So I wrote poetry, but I wasn't interested in reading anything, <laughs> but I was interested in, in writing poetry. Yeah, well, that's really interesting because it's the same thing kind of happened for me. I, I started writing poetry a little bit in high school, 
just because we had an assignment where if you wrote um, so anything, anything creative, you get extra credit. And so I just, every week, there was a little prompt, and I just, it's much easier to write a little short poem than it is to right. uh, write a, um, <laughs> a story or something. And so I ended up writing just a poem every week, and, and I liked the feel of doing it. And then when I was in college, I, th- I didn't think about being a poet at all, really. I wanted to be a science fiction type writer. If I, that's what I was going into creative writing for. I only took a poetry class because I thought that would help the skill of writing, you know, describing scenes and things like that. And then so you fall back to where you started, which is a, a, always a really interesting thing. Um, so, so your poems are very atmospheric. Um, they do have this sort of quality. Um, the next one is Gift Skull. And I think it's a good example of that. There's a sort of a moody... There's sort of a, you know how certain like directors always have a kind of like color scheme in their films. There's kind of a feeling like that to a lot of your poems. I think Gift Skull is a good representative example of that. Do you want to read that? And then maybe we'll talk about the mood of the poem. Sure. Uh, This poem actually appeared first in Rattle. Um, Gift Skull. For years she kept it hanging like a mute wind chime from a sweet gum limb near her tomato plants, a bleached possum skull she discovered with her fingers while planting seeds. The dead mother of she thinks each time she sees it, as though we suckle at the open eye socket, as though fifty teeth are the only comfort we can know. Once she watched a marsh hawk struck by a pickup while it was swooping low across the road. The bird lived for a few moments in the drainage ditch twitching like an epileptic, gathering itself in the great shroud of wings. Sometimes the wind sways the skull as though the ghost in it has come alive. She might be watching from the window or kneeling before her vines, and the gift of the moving skull reminds her of rocking a child in a cradle, reminds her of gripping her knees and rolling forward, then backward, and then weeping. After her infant son died, her breasts were still heavy and swollen with milk. She imagined it as ghost milk. And after the hawk grew still, she stood at the side of the road and thought of the possum waddling once out of the woods and now swaying as a skull on a string, the wind rolling through its open eye sockets and along the great profusion of its teeth. Yeah, so beautiful images in that poem. And you can feel the the atmosphere that it creates. It's always interesting to me because we read submissions anonymized. Um, I just, you know, see the poems, and there's certain poets I sort of know or I think I know who they are based on just the font they use. I think, oh, this is this is this guy who uses that font, you know, or or whatever. And for years, I really feel like there's an atmosphere that's sort of a, of a of a um, Doug Ramsbeck poem that you sort of pick up on, <laughs> and that's my first indication that it might be your poem, Doug. So, what can you tell us about that? Why do you think you're drawn to the type of imagery? And I don't know what I don't even know how to articulate that quality. It's very few poets that have. A sort of a, a sense of atmosphere like that. I, I think maybe like landscapes. People who are in some of the blurbs for your books are talking about um, the way you paint a landscape is one of the things that 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 it, to represent that. But but can you talk a little bit about that? About where that comes from? Do you think? I think a lot of when I first began writing poetry, I was writing all different kinds of poems. I mean, I was sort of experimenting out in a lot of different directions. I do think I wrote a poem that was called "Where We Come From." That was a poem about superstition. And I do think that has sort of influenced everything I've written since then. There's sort of the feeling of, again, of animism looking to the natural world for the for the story and for the for the emotions. And so to me the atmosphere is sort of reading the psychology into the into nature and sort of seeing those two things as being connected. And I think that's the one thing that I sort of feel I've come back to again and again when I sit down to write a poem. And again, if, if if I'm not sort of thinking about it, if I'm trying to come up with a title, it's a title that has some of that feeling that'll draw me to it and then make me want to try to write that poem. Hmm. But I do think that's been everything, every book I've written, I've kind of taken that as a starting place and then tried to find some way to, to come at it in a new direction. Hmm. Another way I think about that is sort of the primitive part of the brain that I'm trying to write out of that primitive part as opposed to the more... Um, the, some of the poems are contemplative. I think it's more of that I'm trying to go for a pounding pulse, a rhythm, a beat that has to do with that sort of primitive part of the brain. Hmm. Yeah, so, so what is it do you think draws you to that animism? Um, and and how, how true do you think that is? Um, do you think that there are connections between things in that way? 
Um, what is your what are your thoughts on that? Again, if you go back, I think to um, sort of the long history of us as as human, that we've often sort of looked to nature to read the signs of it, to try to understand ourselves, to think that by reading you know, the falling leaves or something or looking up at the moon or whatever, that somehow these are cues or clues to who we are in some sense. And so, you know, if you think of the, the human brain as having these sort of ice cream scoops that we've got the primitive part at the bottom and then you've got these scoops that have become more sophisticated as we evolve, I do think that we sometimes forget that that, that, that first scoop is still there. And I think we still sort of see the world as and its meaning as coming to us sort of through these things around us, that if we could just read, we could just read things clearly enough, we could hear the wind well enough, we could really figure out something about ourselves. So do I think there is some actual connection there? I don't know. I think it, I think it, but I do think that's the way we view the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just so fascinating. It, it you know, brings back the idea of poetry as divination. You know, there's a sense that we we have where we're, you've already mentioned that you're just listening for the poem, and there's a sort of feeling when you when you get into that flow state, that zone where you're really focused and concentrated on what comes, that it's coming on its own from some other place. It's not actually you generating the poem. Um, it is something that's coming from nature, or the collective unconscious, or whatever it is, um, to put words on the page and make a voice like you're the conduit for something higher. Um, is that the the sense of that? Do, would you say that's the joy you get from writing, is feeling that sense that you're divining something, that you're listening more deeply and, and something else is coming through? I do. I, I, I would agree with that completely. I do think that's a lot of what sort of motivates me to write. I do think there's a kind of a pleasure or even, and there is the feeling of there's some kind of meaning to it, some larger meaning that you're you're creating something, you know, and again, I don't know how much of this is real, how much of it is illusion. Those are separate issues. But I, but I do think that it's something that is, it isn't, the emotion of it feels spiritual in some way. It does feel, I think, uh, some of the things you imagine in the Back in the old days in the Catholic Church, when they used to have the sermons in Latin, you might not be able to understand what the words were, but there was there was a feeling of the, the significance of it. Of some, maybe because you didn't understand the words, they held some greater sort of spiritual character to them. Mm -hmm. And I do think that kind of cadence that you have in poetry has that same kind of spiritual feeling. Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, let's hear another poem, Doug. This is shell casings. My brother would line up the bullets on the back porch and arrange them in such an exact formation that I was almost sad when he pushed the first one into the chamber and I watched the 22 casing fly, watched the tin can jump or the blue jay become a confetti of feathers or the squirrel drop from its high limb to convulse on the grass before growing still. But when my brother shot Ralph, the neighbor's cat, and we buried him near my mother's tomato plants, I kept kept remembering as we dropped his limp body into the hole how he would rub against my legs each time I crossed in the next yard to ask Miss Orlean if she needed her lawn cut or her weeds plucked or her driveway shoveled. For days we heard Mrs. Orlean alternately call Ralph, Ralph, then Kitty Baby, Kitty Baby, which I found myself remembering last summer when my own cat was dying slowly of kidney failure. In Spike's final weeks I carried him sometimes out the back door so we could lie together by the pond and I would look up at the world, old world of the sky while I studied a dragonfly flitting atop the quiet green waters, where I would run a hand across its fur and recite as best I could the lines from the Lake Isle of Innisfree, which he seemed to appreciate more or less, and I spoke the words again on the afternoon we buried him not far from my wife's tomato plants, and as I gripped the shovel, I remembered how those casings would be warm to the touch after having flown toward me on the porch and how Spike's fur collected and hoarded the heat of the sun as he lay with his eyes closed. And I recalled my long dead brother touching a hand to my shoulder as we stood above the grave, and how he told me to go inside, to let him finish up, that it was all okay, that everything was okay, to trust him, it was okay. Yeah, it's another great poem by Doug Graham Speck that is Shell Casings. And Doug, uh, I think it's the one of the only times in all the episodes we've had a poet that's so um, centered in fiction and creating characters too. Um, and it, it's always interesting to me that um, 
you know, there's, there's something that, that's sort of the same kind of creativity generating characters as there is generating anything else. Like images, you know, are just as, um, they come from the same place. You know, is, is there a certain way you develop characters in your poems? Um, do, is there, how do you, how do you conjure them? Well, one of the things that uh, I always have trouble with is because I'm trying to do it in a way that's not conscious, sort of coming up with a conscious explanation is sometimes pretty difficult. I don't think I'm thinking about character when I'm writing. Um, I think I'm thinking about sort of the feeling of it, this, the sense of it, the voice of it, and letting the voice make some of those decisions. Um, clearly, that sort of dynamic between the brothers there is something I've written about before. Um, and in, in, in fiction as well as in poetry. So I do think sometimes there, there can be a kind of repetition in my poetry. I tend to come back to the same things again and again. And it's I don't know why there are often things that are fictional. They're not real. I, I don't have a brother. I've never had a brother. I've written many, many poems about a brother. Um, and, and I do think that they're... So I think the characters develop over time. So I, I come to the poem sometimes knowing who the characters are. Hmm. rather than sort of creating them at the, in, the, in the process itself. Well, that, that's so interesting. Would you say that the characters are maybe all aspects of yourself in some way? Um, like if, if the world was different, that would be me. Or, or you know, if, if these relationships or this, this is like a fragment of my relationship here and there. Is that how do you think characters develop? Or do you think it's people you've met maybe? Um, is there a source to them? Do you have any awareness of I do think in the poem, for example, I just read there are parts of that certainly that do, I do connect to in my life. Almost nothing that happened there was true, but I do think that there's certainly parts of it that um, when I was in I was in camp as a kid and we used to shoot 22 rifles, and I remember that feeling of the shell casings being warm to the touch. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the some of those things come from things that, that out of memory. Um, but I do think that the storylines themselves are really sort of things that are often constructed. Um, I don't think I'm really answering your question, but I think, but I'm, but I'm, I don't quite know how to, because I, because again, I'm not sure. It may be that some of these things come out of who I am or come out of me, but it's not something again that I'm thinking about when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's just such great advice to try not to think, to try not to have that willful will that gets in the way. You know, one of the things we always talk about on the show is how great and creative the young poets tend to be until they get around to age 13 or 14 and then they get self-conscious about it and you know they and that's when you start to have cliche you know because you're trying to say things in ways that um you've heard before and you know that way and so you won't embarrass yourself but there's all this like awareness of of yourself going on in the process of writing that doesn't happen when you're long, young so it's always a a way of trying to find your way back to that childlike state where you're just having fun and playing with language and not worrying about anything else. So it's really fun to hear, you know, you had that gap in the middle and you sort of came back to writing that way. Um, yeah, it's really fascinating stuff, Doug. Um, I should say, if anybody has any questions for Doug, um, leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube, and I can pass them along. Also, I should say at this point, if you uh, have, uh, haven't clicked the like button yet, um, where I can't see how many likes. Yeah, we have 17 likes over on YouTube, and we got a lot more people than that listening. So if you haven't clicked the like button yet, please do click the like button over on YouTube too. All of it helps to spread poetry around. That's how algorithms work. The more you click, the more other people see it. So you're sort of uh, pushing poetry forward with every click you make. Um, but let's hear the next poem, Doug. Okay, uh, this one is called Blue Toaster, and this was from my first book. And again, in this book, I think I'm still experimenting with a lot of different kinds of poetry before I sort of really began writing with animism. Um, in the final summer of his life, Dr. Mengele took a job as a greeter at a Walmart in Miami. He rented a small room above a bodega. In the evenings, he read the Aeneid or took a bus to the beach so he could stand in the sand slathered with sunscreen and watch the waves grow slowly gray then disappear. For a short time, he kept a dream journal, expecting to write about gypsies, dwarves, twins, Jews, castration, transfusion, sex changes, and surgeries, but instead he dreamed each night of a shy shop girl he'd adored when he was a young boy at the Gunsberg Gymnasium, or about the blue toaster he had bought a few days earlier with his employee discount at Walmart, or about how his long-lost son Rolf would have liked the french fries at McDonald's, or the salsa music that always seemed to be vibrating against his apartment window after midnight, 
Only for a brief while did he collect assassin bugs and pickle jars to see how they would respond to being left on his baking windowsill at noon, but eventually let them go and drank an American beer and listened to the Florida Marlins on the radio. At work, he learned to smile and nod as, as each customer arrived through the automatic doors. It was a small miracle, he thought. The doors whooshed open, and there they were. And only sometimes did he recall the railhead at Auschwitz, where he would point each prisoner to the left or to the right. Now he pointed toward the appliance section, or maybe to the toys, and small children occasionally ran up to hold his hand. Yeah, that's Blue Toaster, another poem um, by Doug Ramsbeck. And uh, so a couple questions come up just based on um, the fact that you're using characters. So, so for the first of all, do you feel any trouble um, with the fact of sort of the appropriation aspect of that, of writing about people that you don't necessarily know? I've had poets on before who you know, don't like that aspect. They stopped writing completely um, in other voices because they don't feel um, that, they're, they, that they should, really. Do you think it's, what do you think about that, about writing in another person's voice? I, I do think that there there would be occasions when I would feel uneasy about that as well, too. I think Dr. Mengele is not one that I felt particularly uh, <laughs> bad about appropriating um, in, in that sense. I, I but, but I do feel like that that is certainly the case that um, I think that I feel I, I think I felt that more strongly sometimes in the writing of fiction, trying to take on voices. I don't think if I but I don't think I do it very often in poetry. I think I'm more often writing um poems that are based on animism based on those characters i certainly don't feel any any qualms about taking on the voices of characters and in, mm -hmm. in the other poems i did write a lot of poems like that I, I thought of them as anachronistic poems taking people who are historical or mythological or um biological you know who are biographical mm -hmm. biography of some character and then putting it into fiction trying to usually sort of twist it in some way to put it in, to mix sort of the modern and the old um I, I do think there would have been circumstances under which I would have felt uneasy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I can certainly imagine cases, but I, I don't think I, when I had one with Socrates. I don't think I felt that I was appropriating anything by writing about something. Putting mm -hmm. Socrates as a homeless man walking the street. So I don't think I, I don't think I felt any qualms about that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's sort of a, another question on this similar topic by Nate Jacob. This is a great question. He says, how do you respond to poetry readers who consider that these stories are always true stories? Um, anyone ever got mad about the invention of characters in such powerful stories? And that's the thing. There is this sort of assumption that we have where any I is the poet themselves and any mother is talking about my mother. You know, there's all that stuff. And then and in a weird way, because we have that assumption, there's often a disappointment maybe that, that that's not this, that's not true. Do you how do you feel about that? Do you do you encounter that? And, and what's your response to it? I do. I, I, I've had that situation where um, I've. There, there is this whole idea when people ask you, is the poem true? Well, what do you mean by true? You know, it, there, there, there are different meanings of that. If the idea is, did this literally happen? That's one kind of question. And I do think that my own feeling was when you, um, and I do think there's certainly people who, when you say, well, no, it didn't happen, there is sort of that, oh, I got I got gypped somehow. I got cheated because, you know, I, I, I thought that here was something that I was true and it turned out to not be true. So I do think that feeling of being cheated certainly is something that is not good, um, that some people feel they're disappointed. I, I don't feel that way. I mean, I, I don't ever ask myself when I'm reading a poem, did this really happen to the person who wrote it? I don't think that matters to me personally. In fact, I'm assuming that some of it may be based on truth, things that actually happen, and some of it may be based on things that were created or made up. I don't think I worry about it either way, though I do understand that there's some people who do. Yeah, well, uh, let's hear uh, the next poem. This is Winter Snow. The images are so faint now, I'm sure only of the far off voice of a classmate asking her, it must have been fourth or fifth grade in a home room, why she was sick all the time, always blowing her nose, always sniffling, and I know her face was as pale as the snowstorms that were forever arriving, the winter we rode the same bus. She sat across from me or behind me or in front of me, and my impression was of the gray char of day, a purgatory of frenetic white outside the window. In high school, she dated a brother of my best friend, and I saw them kissing once on the ice rink in Collier Park, 
Her nose was pink with cold, and she kept running a mitten beneath it, and later I watched her skate awkwardly before the sky's dark mirror. I heard a rumor that she had an abortion her first year of college, and I saw her one summer in shorts, bare feet, and a t-shirt, walking along the shoreline of Lake Michigan. I know we spoke briefly about our lives, but what I remember are the sluggish waves washing with determined adamancy around us. I heard she married after that, had two children, divorced, moved to Arizona, moved back to Illinois, then took her life in her childhood bathroom. But none of that is real, of course. None of that stays. I hear her sniffling in the far off class, dabbing the Kleenex to her nose, hear the voice, the voice rising up accusatory, and I see her shrugging in her seat and later see her kissing my friend's brother beneath the black orchard of winter sky. Yeah, that was Winter Snow by Doug Ramsbeck. Um, so Doug, a lot of people have mentioned in the comments how much they love your imagery. Um, and it's one of the things, we're talking about the atmosphere, but the images are so precise um, and compelling too. Would you say, where are they generated? Are they generated as images first, or does the the sound of the, the music of the language generate the images? Is there a, or is there a bi-directionality to it? I mean, what comes first, the chicken or the egg <laughs> with your images? I think that, again, I'm a lot of what I will try to do when I'm writing a poem is I will open a book at random, and if I see a word, then I will try to put that word into the next line, especially if I'm stuck, if I'm no longer moving quickly. And so oftentimes those images arrive because I see a word and then I know sort of what the next line is meant to be about. And having that word that I didn't expect hmm. forces me to look at that, that idea, that image in a new way. So bringing kind of randomness into it helps me come up with an image that maybe isn't just the, one, the first one you would expect. So I'm trying to, I, I, I think, for example, I, I referred one poem to a cortex of stars, for example. If I sat down and tried to think of it, I wouldn't probably think of that, but I sort of opened a book and I saw the word cortex and I knew the next line was sort of about stars. And so I began to connect those things in my mind. And so for me, it is the random process of creating images. It's also moving fast. The faster I write, usually the better the writing becomes, the slower I write, the less good it becomes. So I try to find ways to move faster. Yeah, uh, again, I mean, it goes back to that divination thing we were talking about before. It's like reading the tea leaves, you know, pulling up a book at random and letting that enter the poem. It makes you wonder if that's even random, if somehow, you know, you were guided to pull up that word. And it's it's just interesting the way that it goes sort of in both ways or it possibly could. Um, you mentioned how quick you write, like trying to stay in that writing fast mode. Um, how fast do you usually write? How long does a poem like Winter Snow, for example, take to write? I'm trying to write as quickly as I can type. So when I'm writing a draft, I mean, it doesn't take me more than 15 minutes to write a, to write a draft of a poem. Um, and then I try after that to, to continue to move fast. And so if I'm writing four poems, they may each take 15 or 20 minutes each. And then I'll try to put them together and that'll take, I try to do that really quickly too. Hmm. So again, I want to, I want to say this quietly because I know you're not supposed to say this. I don't spend a lot of time on poems. They tend to be done quickly. Hmm. Um, and it's, and it, I have found that the long, if I start spending a lot of time on a poem and I'm revising a poem a lot, that's a bad sign. That's a sign that it's for me, it's not working. Hmm. Um, they don't get better by, with more drafts. I wish they did. But by the time I'm more than a, a few drafts in, it's going to go downhill from there. Yeah, well, that, that's interesting, too. Um, so would you say you spend a lot of time reading? Like, do you build up a lot of fuel um, linguistically by reading books of certain types? Um, is that part of the process, too, in the off hours? I do think that in terms of poetry, when I, I first began writing poetry, I'd read almost no contemporary poetry. I'd read a lot of older poetry, but no contemporary poetry. So I think I came to it without really much idea of what of what the contemporary poetry landscape was like. But as I began writing it, I began reading a lot of contemporary poetry. And I do think that influenced a, way, a lot of the ways I looked at poems and looked at the potential of poetry, what poems could do. And I do think that's something that helps me a lot when I read poems, especially ones that just begin to inspire me that really I just think, oh, wow, I wish I could write something like that. I do think that it does begin to that really is helpful to me to write. And I think it is that almost that spiritual feeling when you read a poem that just is sort of on that level where you just feel like everything is elevated. That sort of makes me then inspire me to want to try to write something 
and to try to get to that place um, if I can myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is really fascinating for me personally, because I go through phases, I find, of my own poetry, where I get bored with myself. And so coming to other, going to fiction is maybe the way, I mean, I wish I could figure out how to do that. And then I think it would have more funny. Sort of for me, it feels like there's certain times where I have a lot of fuel. There's a lot of like things that I need to get out and understand or that I'm not really making sense of. And other times I sort of feel like I've got a handle on it. and <laughs> There's no need to write poetry. Um, and so I, that's sort of the, in the phases that I go through um, throughout my life. So it's fascinating to think about you know, moving out beyond the self into, into fiction. Um, I, I'm interested in that section of your life between your twenties and, and age 50, where you uh, weren't writing. Um, what were you doing? Were you a professor teaching literature or something like that? Yes. Um, I taught, I worked for a long time at the Ohio state university on the Lima campus where I was, I'd had a lot of different jobs there. I was an um, instructor of English. I also then ran our writing center and then later the Learning Center. And um, I was teaching composition. I was teaching literature classes. We're a small, small department, a big university, but our campus was small. And so I, I taught a little bit of everything. And then after I began writing poetry, and then later I began teaching all our creative writing classes on the campus too. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, for, for creative writing teaching, and we talked at the, at the top about MFA programs and how they don't allow that creativity to flourish. They're sort of focused on the nuts and bolts, which are definitely important. You know, you need to know the tools of making writing compelling. Um, but, but how did you go about teaching with that mindset? Um, how did you teach students to be creative and let themselves go? I do think that you have to be careful because I think the common method is just to focus on the workshop and, I, and to have that sort of be the center of every class. And I find that if you're just doing that, maybe some of that can be useful. But I, I often felt that if you're just doing that, you're just exercising the conscious brain and uh, you're not really sort of developing the more creative part of it. And so I think you have to be careful about it, though. I do think there are ways to make the workshop a more creative process. If instead of just dissecting what's working here, what's not working here, which I think for some people isn't helpful at all, it becomes instead a, a brainstorming session where everyone is being creative and trying to come up with a lot of creative ideas and uh, sort of going back and forth in terms of thinking about it. I also tried a lot in the classroom to get my students doing exercises that would help them think about what I would think of as sort of effective technique. You, you mentioned the idea of images. I think a lot of beginning students, the problem they have is they're trying to make everything abstract. They're not trying to sort of see, to think like a poet, I think, means thinking through the specifics of the world. And so I think you can create exercises where you're asking students to generate specifics, um, details, images, and then let the poem sort of flow out of that creation. So a lot of what I try to do is to work on those things. And I do think a lot of it was you could just see it where their students. One of the nice things about teaching creative is you could see it sometimes when students would just let go, their work would just shoot up in quality. And the good news about that doesn't always happen in the teaching of composition is usually when they got there, they stayed there. Mm -hmm. There were exceptions to that, but each time you sort of move up a level, then you, then you can uh, you, you don't fall back again in the next project. You keep going. Yeah, well, that definitely makes sense. Uh, along the same lines, there's a question from Jamie Thomas, who is a big fan, based on comments uh, already during the episode. Um, but during your years of teaching English at OSU, is there any advice to aspiring poets or cross genre writers that might be unexpected? So, so I asked sort of about the typical advice, but do you have any um, unexpected advice or surprising things that you might offer to a student? I kind of think that the fact that I began writing poetry before I'd read much poetry was in some ways kind of helpful hmm. because I didn't have in my head limitations. I didn't have in my idea this is what a poem had to be. Uh, this is what I had to write to try to fit in. I began sending things out for publication before I really had some idea. Um, the other thing I think about a lot is everyone talks about the importance of creating an individual voice. And what in the world does that mean? You know, we, we use that term all the time. And to me, it really is a matter of taking whatever it is you do best and just making it more and more extreme. Uh, no half measures. Hmm. Make it as extreme as you possibly can, that one thing you do well. And then when you've got when you're there, then try to make it more extreme still and just keep going. And I, don't, I, I think that's how maybe what it means to arrive at a voice, because otherwise I don't really know what 
I struggle sometimes myself in thinking about what does it mean to have a voice? Why do some poets seem to have it? Why do poets, some other poets don't seem to have it? I've seen this too from reading. I've been a reader for a number of poetry contests, both as an early reader and then also as sort of a finals judge. And I do think that when you do that, I'm sure you see this because you read so many poems coming in, there are an awful lot of poems that are really technically quite good, but they all sound the same. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, because of that similarity, they don't jump out at you. And maybe a poem that is um, different and not technically as strong jumps out at you more just because it's not like every other poem you're reading. And so I do think finding ways to not feel like you're trying to sound like other people, trying to sound like other poems, trying to sound like other things that are being written, but trying to sound like, write things that don't sound at all like the things that are being written, I think maybe can be helpful. Yeah, I think that is great advice. And to me, there is a voice that stands out when the poem is interesting and unique. And it, it does come from that. To me, it's a sense of a real person speaking. Um, you know how you have like, you, you know, talking about the weather, if you meet somebody at a park or something and you're just having a conversation, um, if there's all this like superficial way that we go through the motions with things, but then there's a deeper person beneath that. Uh, it's sort of almost a mask of regularity. And there's a deeper person beneath that that's so strange and idiosyncratic and weird because we all are. And that voice emerging is what, you know, hearing that specific person like an actual person is what you're listening for as a poet. And having, and that's, I think, what we mean by voice. I think it's a great way to put that. And no half measures is really great advice and unexpected, too. That was a tough question. And uh, that was a good one to come up with, Doug. Um, let's see. Well, we're about, let's do uh, the last poem. We're about, oh, about time to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, this is from my most recent book, Blur, and the title of the poem is Spume. In summer rain weather, the neighbor boy drowned, and the river said, see how my cattails bend in the current. And the river said, I carry your dead in my arms. And the river was visible from the house, and the brown hurry said, I exist beneath the fat gods of the low-slung clouds. And sister stood at the window and thought, these clouds are an owl digging its talons into back flesh. And the brothers stood at the window and thought, dead boy, dead. And the dead boy, who is no longer in the river, said, the years are something listing in a dusty cellar jar. And mother walked down to the river and thought, if you squeeze a tomato in your fist, it bleeds. And father walked down to the river and thought, I didn't know you had it in you. And father remembered dragging a catfish once from that river and thinking, you are dead, but don't know it yet. And father remembered stomping on the head of the fish with a boot that said, mercy. And the river said, dusk light is clinging to my body. And the river said, here is my premonition. And the boys walked down to the river and said to the spume, sing your death song, river. And the river said, this is my trumpet and my measure. And the river said, this is my eye hold of the world. And the river said, I am a river, a river, a river. Yeah, a great poem to close on, Doug. And that was from Blur. Uh, that was spume from the book Blur, your most recent. And you can see a different sort of structure in that poem, too. Um, you know, that it's not... It's not typical sentence narrative type poem, you know, no punctuation, the spaces um, and that repetition. Um, it, is that something that you're doing more often? I think that I move back and forth. I do think mm -hmm. that when I first began writing poetry, I didn't do that at all. Uh, the longer I began to write, I began to sort of move back and forth between the two. And I do think a lot of what happened with me in the, in the, in the writing of this particular book was that I began moving it. What I tried to do I began with these two brothers who I thought were sort of almost young boys who were almost feral creatures who um, primitive in many ways. And I wanted to try to get their primitive voice. And it seemed to me that one way to do that was to eliminate punctuation, eliminate sort of that usual sentence structure to sort of get. So it seemed I was hoping it would then seem more primitive. Mm -hmm. And um, and what do you have uh, coming up next before we go? Is there since you write in such a spontaneous way? Do you have an idea of where your work is headed or what the next book might be? Do you have something in, in progress? I have a, a, a new book and that I uh, begun sort of sending around. I do think that, and to me, again, usually it starts in sort of one place and then the, the 
everything kind of branches out from there. In many ways, the, the, the book is came from a poem that was published in The Sun that was about a, a, um, a mother with some um, mental issues and sort of how the, the children interact with her and how they felt about that, both the wonders of that and the, the greater wonders of that than otherwise, but also some of the horrors of that. And I, that was sort of the character I began with. So I began thinking about her, thinking about her children and writing based on that. Hmm. Well, it's very fascinating, Doug. Thanks so much for being a guest today. Yeah. Uh, beautiful poems and really interesting discussion, too. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. And that was uh, Doug Ramsbeck. You can find all of Doug's work at his website, which is DougRamsbeck.com. Uh, that's DougRamsbeck.com. So find all uh, nine poetry collections, uh, the short story collection and novella, all there, um, plus the book he was just talking about that's going to be forthcoming at some point, too. Um, now we're going to take a quick break and go to our open lines, or prompt lines, I should say. And the prompt for this week was to write a poem set in spring that includes personification. Um, and so if you have a poem like that, um, or anything from previous weeks as well, um, share it by going to our Zoom link. I'm going to copy the invitation link. Um, and then uh, I'll put it into the chat windows on Facebook or YouTube. So find them there and email your poem to promptlines at rattle.com so I can show it on the screen like we did with Doug's poems as we were reading. It's nice to read along as we're listening to poetry. So email it to promptlines at rattle.com, then find the Zoom link, which I'm about to deploy, and I will be right back with more poetry. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Uh, we have a prompt poems editor here. We are arranging furniture and getting it all set up, making sure we both had actual headphones, which is important <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk to people. Yeah, it is, it turns out. <laughs> so hi, it's Katie Dojo here, our prompt poems editor. How are you doing today, I'm Katie? doing great. I love that discussion like this and the idea. <laughs> Clearly, we need <laughs> the furniture arrangement. Mm -hmm. And talking about the flow state hacks, I thought that was really interesting. Kind of like how Doug was self prompting, was how I saw it too. With the, the word, the random word, I love that too. I want to try that. Yeah, there were some great exercises Doug had to share. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it really went along with our poetry space episode, I which know. we might as well plug because we talked yeah. to Bob Hickok on the poetry space last week mm -hmm. um, and other friends about uh, the flow state and how, yeah. you know, he's one of those writers who definitely tries not to be conscious when he writes. So it was mm -hmm. interesting to talk about that concept. Mm -hmm. It um, was episode 57 available on podcast <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so as you uh, as you said, uh, or I said, the prompt for this week was to write a poem set in spring that includes personification. So what did you do? I had fun with this one. I actually, I don't know if you got my most recent edit, but I read it aloud to Lizzie to practice and realize I need to change something. So we'll see oh, okay. if it's the unedited version that I'm going with. So. Well, I could pull up the uh, one from your document. I can just say what I changed and show okay. how imperfect I am, and everyone will be like, yes, we know that already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here you go. Okay, spring. There she sat in the nest of a rope net, the other kids buzzing beneath her, her eyes watering, her cry, mommy, shooting up the starburst tulips. Just when the sun had warmed the metal bars beneath her, it shied away again, leaving the little girl stuck amidst all that afternoon fray to shiver in her t-shirt, no longer at play, in her princess pajama top, on which she wiped her nose as her icicle calls threatened to freeze the playground's metal bars. Her sneeze sputtered frost. A snowflake landed on her sleeve where she spied Rapunzel, how she knew no one would reach out to catch her. She turned her eyes into a drought, and just when the sun tucked itself deeply within the clouds, that's when the little girl sprung out. Oh, that was great. And I happened to be there for the making of that poem at the you playground. Were, you were. This is like a totally true story. This poor little girl uh, that got lost and kind of trapped. And I realized as I was taking a shower that I like, she has a perfect personification for spring with her brummy, snotty nose and her like, she can't tell if she wants to jump out or if she doesn't want to jump out. So it is true. It's kind of funny. There's a four-year-old walking around the woodlands that has a poem written after. It is. So, yeah. yeah. Very accurate depiction of it too, I must say. That's actually a personification. Thank you. Um, here's my uh, little poem. This is uh, a lesson in spring. And I was thinking about, um, about, for some reason, why not trying to expand a haiku format into a regular mm, poem? With like, okay. so uh, this is uh, this is what came up with that that thought for a second. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, here we go. This is uh, this week's poem: "A Lesson in Spring" for me. A lesson in spring. Last year's last apple hangs from the black branch as soft as a stewed tomato. It blooms a blossom of wet wax beside the new buds. How impatient the children seem, drawing shapes with a stick in the dark dirt, waiting for their turn to replace us. Oh. So that is that is my a lesson in spring. Mm. Um, it's even with the typo there that I almost read. So there, fix yeah, that. Yeah, I saw. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that is uh, that is my prompt poem for this mm-hmm. week. So let's see what everybody else has. And first, we will go to Carla Schwartz first in line. Good to see you, Carla. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, great to have you. And great to be here. What a what a really interesting night of poems and fiction and everything together. So um, I took this. Um, I uh, started to write about pea shoots, but um, I just I went a different direction. So I wrote about a, a Singer sewing machine that takes place in spring. It's like a fifty-year-old machine, and it's called at least 50 oh. years old, and it's called oh. Slant, Slant-O-Matic. <laughs> I thought that was a title. I was about to say, I have the wrong poem. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. okay. We have slant o We're good. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Projects, worrisome projects, you elude me. I'm stuck in your basement, living in lint and congealed oil until this spring day, this drizzly day, you lift me, cradle me, carry me upstairs into the light and begin to lubricate. I'm stiff with age, but feel me loosen. Oh, such a bath. Play me some Elvis now, don't be cruel, something someone my vintage can swing to. I'll swivel my hips and slide my toes like a pendulum to your pedal. Here, like this, oh, a little more, here, no here, feel me purr, let me ride fabric feed me feed me more yes more cloth what i eat i'll stitch what you need yeah excellent poem carla yeah great use of the personification aspect of the prompt i love a bunch of those lines in there yeah that was really wonderful personification (laughs) oh thank you so much glad to know it see ya 
Yep. Bye. Bye. That was Carla Schwartz with a Slantomatic. And uh, next in line is Nate Jacob, who's quick on the buzzer today. Hey, Nate. Hey, I am uh, willing to sell the secret to beating Dick Westheimer into this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. Interesting. Is it the baseball hat instead of the beanie? Is that part of the speed secret? I have no idea how I did it. This must be a pretty good week. Uh, I'll take it. Call it a win. Um, hey, I... Uh, I don't think I know what personification is, but I did <laughs> I did feel prompted by the prompt to write this poem. So mm-hmm. I hope it counts. Okay. okay. I'm sure it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is about spring, uh, titled Spring Whispers to Us About Winter. Um, personification in the title. <laughs> yeah, <there> you, <laughs> yeah, you did that, it already. That's all I got. <laughs> that works, Nate. Yep, that's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> There's an epigraph from an Oscar Wilde story. Uh, a woman of no importance says, the soul is born old but grows young. That is the comedy of life. And the body is born young but grows old. That is life's tragedy. That's pretty cool. How odd to sit facing the bloom of daffodils while speaking with my sister of memory care of a faltering old woman who lives between us a thousand miles from either of us with a mind which more and more remembers less and less while she asserts that all is well, all is not well. In the directionless breeze is yet the wavering hint of a winter from which we may not recover the mother of our youth. A spring morning we had not expected to dawn on us for years. Everything is buds and blossoms and shoots, but in these corners of the garden, Fall leaves a dusty and gray-brown reminder that life springs into life from below the remains of last year. Mother wandered the airport last fall, suddenly unsure of her coming or her going. Memory lost somewhere between the two, and though she was arriving, she wants to go. How odd to sit in the rising light of spring, to feel its pull to life's regular renewal then to speak instead of the coming fall, to stare down the sun, preferring blindness in summer and autumn, letting winter loom, its gray-brown covering all we'd rather forget. Hmm. Yeah, beautiful poem. And there's a lot of personification there, I have to say. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, undersold again, Nate Jacobs. (laughs) Lucky shooting, I guess. All right, very fun. Thanks so much, Nate. Oops, I forgot to do that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nate. It was Nate Jacobs with uh, or Nate Jacob with Spring Why Whispers. Why do I pluralize this last I name? Know. It's mean. I'm sorry. Well, to me, they're a bunch of uh, athletes, you know, yeah. that had Jacobs, and so my whole brain, all names are athletes yeah. of some kind. He's when just I was a so kid. jaunty. He deserves an S. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that, yeah, that was Nate Jacob once again with Spring Whispers to us about winter. And now Dick Westheimer, who revealed his secret in the chat window. I don't know if you saw that. (laughs) No, I didn't see that. (laughs) His secret. Would you like to reveal your secret, Dick? (laughs) Well, what I did this time, (laughs) what I did this time so I wouldn't be first as I counted to 20 to make sure folks had a chance. You put yourself in timeout. (laughs) (laughs) Spoken like a true mother. (laughs) Yes, there I was in, in time out. I, lo- I love the Doug Ramsbeck interview. And especially, um, Doug was the first workshop, second workshop that I poetry workshop I ever went to. Doug was the instructor, but he didn't make it because he was um, um, had a detached retina. And he wrote me this long email, which I did not understand at the time. Wow. And I just back went back and reread it uh, after the interview, and there's a lot of good stuff in what he wrote me. <laughs> um, I just wasn't ready to ready to hear it at the time, uh, but the interview sort of primed it. So I'm going to write him a note and thank him for this thing I couldn't understand when I was a infant poet. Oh wow, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff, and I'm glad to see that he's seeing well again. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely um, true too. So spring personification, it, it's like, it's like, it's all over, right? <laughs> Anybody who's been out in the garden, it's all alive and it's all acting, you know, either it's acting like humans or 
were acting like it. So this, <laughs> this spoke to me. Um, so do you have the poem up, Tim? Yep, go ahead. Okay, here we go. The long game. The soil's been snugged in its garden bed all winter. It now yawns, remembers snippets of its dreams as I pull back its quilt of straw and leaves. I hum morning tunes and scratch its back with my springtime rake, stir worms to the surface, and then, with grandfatherly care, tuck into it spring seedlings that have awaited its embrace. The root tips quiver, tickled by a biota frenzy, hypha twine and seductive caress. The soil does not know the name of the plants, the spinach and onion starts, the swelling pea seeds, but it welcomes them to its hearth like an innkeeper would with a warm meal, like water to a wave. Naive, you may say, and it's true. It welcomes to the dozer tread and blade, lets concrete press on its back. But time ticks slow for it. A single beat of a soil's teeming heart lasts eon longer, eons longer than we can dream. And soon, in earth time, house and road and gardener and hoe will all return to it. Oh, yeah. Great poem. I, I had a, fe a feeling that you might have an interesting take on uh, spring, given that you're a resident gardener. Yeah. And so right. it definitely, it definitely worked. Uh, excellent poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Gardener, gardener and residence on Rattlecast. I'll take that for the time. <laughs> until somebody else, somebody else claims the mantle. <laughs> well, I think you've got it for a long time. Dave. Yeah. Thanks for being here <laughs> and being our gardener yeah. and keep feeding us those delicious veggies. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank, right. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. So Dick Westheimer with The Long Game. And next, let's go to um, Stephen Croft. Hey, Tim. Hey, Stephen. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, I uh, live on the eastern seaboard on the coast, and so more and more spring is just a prelude to hurricane season for me. I've been hit pretty hard by a couple hurricanes, Irma and Matthew. So... Uh, I think my take on spring is a little dour and uh, this is when lightning walks epigraph from Jennifer Francis Woodwell Climate Research Center as sea ice disappears and the Arctic Circle land areas warm much more rapidly in spring the atmosphere becomes more unstable allowing abnormal bubbles of warm air to rise which can trigger uncommon thunderstorms. When lightning walks across the top of the world, an unknown mystical experience of boom and flash in the white realm of reindeer herders. What if this rupture of sky spreads like a horrible fault, like fires known only to the south moving all the way north now, like the water clock of melting ice flowing down now, its mad wind raising a demonic song, pell-mell, all over the whole world, singing of diminishing harvests, sea rise refugees, a growing maelstrom that will rip the green coat of the native earth to tatters, making broken toothpick towns of our civilization, of our civilization casting them over the land, like divination, what if? Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Definitely an interesting take, too, on uh, spring, walking in with the lightning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, fascinating poem and, and definitely a good reminder, too, of uh, the, the other side of spring. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, Stephen Croft with When Lightning Walks. And uh, next we have Bishwajit Mishra. Hey Tim. Okay. Hey, Good hi. evening and happy Easter, guys. I mean, Thank literally. you. Yeah, same to you. <laughs> okay. So, what have you got for us? Uh, I've got uh, breaking ground. All right. Yeah, I've got it up right here. Anything you want to say about it, or just jump right in? 
I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Spring is uh, it's like a high quest cash, like the everybody goes for spring. That's where they get the maximum <laughs> harvest. But uh, I wouldn't say it was easy for me. I, but I had to write something, so I'm thinking <laughs> I might be. I might be repeating myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great yeah. honest confession like, in yeah. the preamble for sure. No, like Doug was saying, and it's exactly like um, I, that's most ninety nine percent. I write my points. I write the title, mm -hmm. whether it's prompt or not. Then I become superstitious. That's how I. <laughs> no, I said if I've written the title, I have to finish the poem. Even ah. if it goes to the junk pile, it doesn't matter. That's a great, yeah, that's a great that's system. Great. Yeah, I really yeah. like that. So Although... I, that's how I do. So I write every day now. I'm back to it because I realize it makes me better mentally. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. I've, I worked it back and said, man, I lost it because I became too ambitious. No, I don't want to be ambitious. I'll go back and like and close my eyes and say, what am I going to write about? Then open the eyes and look at the clock. Then in your mind, you're fighting. What the hell? I've written five points. <laughs> <laughs> the hell did you write? <laughs> then it turns superstitious. It's a gift. If you, if you read, it's like a beggar. You're asking for something, and if you refuse, it's going to go away. Oh, I think great. I think using that quote about what the hell I've written five poems about clouds as an epigraph would be fun too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's why I liked it. I mean, I'm not uh, as good as him but i'm saying still this is how it works uh -huh. and i have figured out a way exactly like the, it, the sooner you get it over is the better and uh and then you can look at it mm -hmm. but that's how i and 99 percent of our points are written on phone <laughs> even when i'm at home oh wow it, these are all the superstitions oh. I have. <laughs> well, that's great. well let's hear this one Patricia. it's a breaking <laughs> ground <laughs> okay breaking ground you put us in the back and the front last year and you're waiting to see us come through you're busy with your projects getting snowed in and you're mad about everything that comes in the way we're almost ready a month ago might have come a bit early this year but the snow hit us twice the other day you were bitching about delays and what others were supposed to deliver the rising prices too even the lack of parking. But when you sit down to write your poems, you start worrying if your investment in us was going to bear any fruit. We want to tell you we are doing our best as always. We are never inert, just unmanifested now. But you probably want us to be like your gods, vindicating you like your projects and spring to be tombstoned in blossoms and elegized in poems. You are unhappy because the snow is holding up spring. Though our spring isn't limited by your calendar, we tulips will be happy to come out of the womb, see the sun, kiss the butterflies, and share your breath. Aww. Yeah, that's sweet. Excellent uh, use of the personification yeah. there. We tulips, I like that. I want to mm -hmm. think of myself as a tulip. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we bought tulips last year and we're waiting eagerly. Oh, <laughs> you'll have to post pictures. I'm sure you'll put a haiku over yeah. some of them and post still, it on Twitter. We got a, like a half a foot of snow in our planter. And that's yeah. why I'm looking at every day and saying, I just, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, Bishop. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good night. Yep, Me you too. too. There's a Bishop Mishra with Breaking Ground. Uh, Susan Talley is next in line. Hello, Thank Susan. You. Hi. Hello. Hi. I have two poems. They're very short. All right. That sounds good. Okay. This is the calm one, and I went crazy on the other one. Personification, <laughs> I think, means metaphor. I couldn't stop thinking of metaphors. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Well, that's yeah. always a good time to write two poems. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe not, that's not pure anthropomorphism. I think I know the difference now. My cat is here anthropomorphically. After the first. After, okay. I got the right one up. Go ahead. Yeah. After the first blush, in their own fashion, supple boughs weigh their crop. A light lift, cumulus, pinks burst open to white, 
a spiritual wine, the upturned branch, a filigree cup. Spring, a prince, regaled breath by breath. Crowds of cherry trees rejoice, flutter fans, arms carry spectrums of dawn. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that one, Susan. And uh, oops, wrong one. Let me see. There you go. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. And uh, Katie had to step out for one second, so there's she might be back. Probably her her daughters are downstairs. Um, oh. And let's hear the other one. Um, okay. This is uh, the second of two, is how it's yeah. listed for me. Okay. This was to be an elegy for two backyard trees sawed to sawed to death when horrible stories spread a real witch hunt, a case for the board of directors after a report, tall oaks had intentions to strangle steam pipes, factor of age under their breath. We should have moved them long ago. With sap, one old soldier at the root of the oak held a declaration guilty by association. You planted us here and turned their attention, and then they, the trees turned their attention elsewhere. The comic dance for Scythia and daffodils flying their yellows by the seat of their pants. Their dearest, and the, these two oaks, their dearest buds danced. Spring, a ballet of sleepy campers rising from chartreuse sleeping bags a modern adaption with a cocoon, more improvisations, organic. The oaks so proud of their offspring, their talented offspring in spring. Ah, oh, beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing that. I love the, the oaks being proud there. That's great. Definitely great personification. Thanks so much for sharing that, Susan. Uh, Susan Talley with uh, two poems. And next we have uh, Brian O'Sullivan. Hey, Brian, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, so, I have a poem that is uh, sort of both for this week's prompt, and I guess it was last week's prompt, the one about the toy. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and it's called The Leprechaun's Tale. Um, All right. Yeah, I have it right here. Go tale. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Of course your mother doesn't feckin' believe in leprechauns. We don't feckin' exist, the leprechaun yelled at me. He was a thumb tall fire sheet gentleman with an ardent supernova erupting like an exploded stereotype from beneath a green hat perched as huge. Since we'd arrived from New York, I've been looking for leprechauns in groves and stream beds and rabbit holes and pools and behind the guise of garden gnomes, and I've been finding them in dreams. But it was better to be able to hold one in my hand once my cousin Siobhan had given me this plush little guy. But when my brother, his hair no less orange than the doll's, told me I was a baby for believing in this shit. And when I asked my mother, I was just old enough to hear between the lines when she said, I'd like to believe, dear. I'd like to believe. The ontological friend zone, the limbo between maybe and no, the last wisp of a Cheshire grin, wasn't what I'd wanted to hear. But the leprechaun was having none of my mood. You are for idiot. The whole point of me is that I don't exist. I'm too twee to be true. I'm a December daisy or a snowball on this fine fool's day. I am what isn't there. Whatever we, hushed, with upturned eyes, wait for on this day as the sweet showers fall. Oh, that was great. Thanks so much for sharing that. I'm set. Too bad uh, Katie had to step out for the feckin' in the way you pronounced that. I'm sure she would have really enjoyed it. But great use of uh, both prompts in one. Really fun, Brian. Well, I'll try to find a reason to say feckin' again sometime. <laughs> You're going to have to. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was Brian O'Sullivan with The Leprechaun's Tale. And uh, let's see, Mike Bales is next. Good evening. I made it on. I, for a while, I clicked down and went, I hope I can get back. I hope I can get in. I'm um, glad you did. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, I'm glad I missed you last week. I kind of played hooky and did karaoke. Oh, um, that's fun. Yeah, what kind, what what you, what's nice your favorite to song to do in karaoke, Mike? <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe by Paul McCartney. It, uh -huh. I feel totally naked when I sing it. Well exposed, it's um, kind of like means what romance that. things go for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's off Egypt Station in 2018. 
I like that. I like I, I will. I've seen that about some people. Mm-hmm. I've seen about a friend now. I don't know if it's working out with her, but <laughs> um, kind of do that. Uh, sometimes when I go up, since I got books out, sometimes when I go up. This one guy plays his lead song, paperback writer, and I'll I'll go I'll go to him. I'm one of those. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, I liked your guy because he's kind of multi-genre, which I kind of am. One mm-hmm. of my books is. Uh, vignettes leading into poems and i like spume that to me that was a poem made out of dialogue and i like dialogue yeah yeah definitely and we didn't talk about dialogue at all uh surprisingly because we were talking about fiction some but that's true um yeah it's a key thing you know everything's got its place i write short stories um sometimes i mean dialogue does its own work setting does its own work action does its own work that kind Mm -hmm. of thing then you got a character arc and all that kind of stuff, which I don't like to be too analytical about. <laughs> I like to do it and kind of look back and see if it's working. So yeah, yeah. I did a slight revision on this. Uh-huh. Um, maybe it's better this way. Maybe it's better the other way. I emailed it to you. It's the early sun. Yep, I have it right here. Go ahead. I'll do it with a slight revision. Maybe it's okay. better than the other version. <laughs> okay. The we'll early see. sun. I celebrate new life as buds burst from branches. I am a soft conversation laughter when lovers walk hand in hand. I am a song in a breeze and a moment of silence embraced. I am a splash of yellow, dandelions in the schoolyard, given as flowers, embraced as, as by gracious mothers. I am the day after the thunderstorm. I shine upon billowy white clouds shaped by idle dreams. Yeah, beautiful poem, Mike. Thanks so much for sharing that. I'm getting over Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> My list for tonight. There you go. Yeah, so Katie has joined us once again. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm being so rude, but Charlotte needed me. Now everything's mm-hmm. good. <laughs> yeah, well, well, the daughters are downstairs. Okay. and uh, <laughs> I'm trying my best. She's trying her best. No yeah, worries. No okay. one feels bad about it. You did miss Brian O'Sullivan no. say feckin' though. A Was bunch Fergus of times. the cat there? <laughs> <laughs> no Fergus, <laughs> but we had uh, Susan Talley had some uh, personification of the cat Aww. popping in too. Aww. Um, well, anyway, let's go on to uh, a first time um, participant, and uh, Siobhan Brownlee is here. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? I can. Hi. So, yes. thanks so much for joining us. Where are you calling from? I live in France. Oh, oh, excellent. So is it, it must be really late there then. It's uh, 3.39 in the morning. Oh, wow. Well, thanks so much for staying up so, <laughs> so late. Nice. Yeah. Um, so this poem is um, it's something that happened to me. My friend told me that he, he ate some aphids because aphids come in spring. And then I went away and wrote the poem. And then I read the poem to him and he said, oh, you got the story wrong. So I felt I had to add another part to it. But I'm worried about the other part. So this is kind of work in progress. Oh, really Wonderful. interesting. Yeah. We love fresh work in progress. We definitely do. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing it. <laughs> okay. So the, the poem is called I'm Sucking, and there are two parts to it. Okay. So I'm Sucking, part one. Spring is come, cleaving the freezing and the flaming. Here sucking sap, I am greedy on a juicy green stalk sun shaded by foliage. A busy ant crawls across hankering after my honeydew. He's my doting friend. He levers away ladybugs of the cupped wing capes that seek to savage me. Moist humors, hyacinths, indulging incessantly in sap, I scent sky-filled blooms. Now I expulse my nymphs, pale green, minuscule, to join the pollulating population. But giant flesh gropes bellicose, scoops me, squashes me, flailing, I'm sliding into a black pitless passage. Gone is spring. Part two. Hey there, just read the poem above. (laughs) Contrary to what that poet wrote, I didn't scoop up aphids and tumble them down my esophagus. I'm a little more refined. What I did was pluck a few aphid-laden mint stalks in the garden. And wrong in the poem, too, is that term pollulating. What a highfalutin word. Anyway, (laughs) the tiny beasts weren't numerous because it was just the start of spring. 
So I took the mint leaves into the kitchen with their companion aphids, mixed mint with lettuce and sliced tomatoes, doused the whole in French salad dressing and ate with relish. Whether the aphids were alive or dead, I can't be sure, and I didn't taste anything peculiar. I did it for fun. And maybe, too, there's a bit of the ogre in me when it comes to critters that lay waste to my cherished garden. <laughs> Leaves shriveled. I feel sorrow. It sucks. <laughs> It's <laughs> so funny. Oh, Thanks great. so much for sharing that. I'm yeah. sucking <laughs> by Siobhan Brown. Yeah. I'm so glad you used the word highfalutin. I think it's my favorite word. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> that is so fun with a great, almost a literate verse in the first section. Yeah. And then um, and then the hyphen too. Yeah, about yeah. as postmodern as a poem can get right there. Yeah, definitely combining it all. Thanks so much for sharing that. I mean, I, I was very worried about that second part because I didn't know whether it would be acceptable. Oh, I because think it's, it's great. It's more than I think acceptable. the shift in voice was really fun. Yeah, that was very fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. Yeah, thanks so much. And so glad you'd sit up. Sorry, it's so late. I wish yes. we could somehow it's stop fine. time. Yes, sorry. The earth or from... just be in France. I oh, would take that also. That's a much better idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Come back again soon. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So once again, that was uh, Siobhan Brownlee with uh, I'm Sucking, <laughs> a really fun poem. <laughs> All right, and next up we have uh, Chelsea McClellan. Hi. Oh no, I that. Hello. Hi, great to see you. Great to see you all. Let me try to pull up everyone. So what did you write about this week? Um, well, I had some trouble, but I took a walk out in the orchard and just kind of tried to do what I found and um, I noticed that some, or that a lot of the um, plants that are starting to come up now are a lot of my medicinals. And so I just kind of wondered what they might say. And then mm -hmm. this one. Came. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, Yarrow. Refusing to concede his time to summer. That fickle winter came back to race the wind again. Eager, sunlight can't help herself but shine. And the clouds, distracted, are no help to the one. By sorrows laid dormant, who must decide today if she is ready to wash off the winter dust or not? If she will awaken with the spring or wait? In this is friendship that when the one too afraid to test the sunshine, stays cocooned. Another, or six, by compassion aroused, emerged to test it for her. Chamomile stops by first, with tea and chocolate to calm her nerves, says, if you're not ready yet, just stay in. I can still sense a chill. Please be patient with yourself. Though not quite ready yet herself, Elderberry, impatient as she is, drives over to help the one cocooned, dares her off the couch and outside to get some fresh air, stays too long, serves her family four-day-old leftovers for supper when she finally gets home, needs a week to recoup, leaf tips, frostbitten, dying, but green at the stem. Marshmallow, coneflower, and Ella campaign carpool to visit their friend. Mallow says, I'm sorry I can't be around more often, but what can I soothe while I'm here? Cone and Elle initiate a group hug. Elle says, please, we're only a phone call away. And Cone finishes her thought saying, if you ever need to talk. As he watches her, watching them drive away, Yarrow peeks around the corner to remind her he has been here all along and will continue to be only a step away if ever cut she needs someone here now to stop the bleeding oh beautiful yeah great use of that whole um penelope panoply of uh, <laughs> of uh of different uh medicinals is different medicinals yeah. yeah i don't know the word you're trying to say i'm sorry <laughs> i wish i could help you but you were closer than i am because i don't yeah. know it yeah it's a really cool concept behind mm -hmm. that i love the idea of them being a group of friends that can't stay in touch <laughs> as much as they'd like to 
Yeah, yeah, really cool. I love yarrow. Yeah. I just love the word yarrow. Also, too. it makes me want tea very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for sharing that, Chelsea. Thank you. That was a yarrow by Chelsea McClellan. And next, let's go to um, uh, Mark Grinier. Hi, Tim and Katie. Hi, Mark. I'm afraid I failed on the uh, on my couple of attempts at spring poems that personify. Somehow I wasn't into spring. I don't know why, but I did try <laughs> and right. make it make an attempt at the uh, at the last week's prompt. The, uh, the 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 toy is the, child, the tile child's toy prompt. Great. And I'm yeah. not sure it's any good either, but it's called the wreck of an old hot rod. Ah. Is it on Submittable? Should I look over yeah, there? Yeah, on Submittable. It was okay. on Submittable. Yeah, let me just give me a second to pull it up. And so okay. this is a child. The prompt, once again, was to write about a childhood toy. Was from the perspective of the toy. Ah, from yeah. the perspective of the toy. And we hear a wreck of an old hot rod. Okay, got it right here, Mark. Okay. I'm not sure about the perspective. <laughs> as, toys, <laughs> as toys go, this was a wreck. Sitting in the center of a neighborhood lot. An attractive nuisance of the worst kind for two small brothers looking for fun. Painted black, it sat on the ground for weeks, resting on concrete blocks, not wheels, with headlights sprouting like toad's eyes from banged up fenders. A narrow hid hood with a chrome grill and a small cube of a cabin in which old tattered seats sat empty as years of neglect behind windows both broken and whole. We couldn't resist that wreck, not the rocks, nor the rocks scattered around the field. Before our eyes, the unbroken glass just begged for a well-thrown stone in a sunlit afternoon. So we picked stone some up and pelted that wreck. The crash of glass was a wonderful sound, even better than the bong uh, of, <laughs> just when I lost my place. Even better than the bong. Oh shoot! Where of stone against metal misses? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, you get even better than this bong of stone against metal misses. <sighs> oh, I see. I know what's happened. Okay. Okay, the thrill of being on our own, away from parental restrictions, was. Spiced by the tingle of fear about breaking big things, glass windows and lights, the painted chassis that might again someday become a loud noise in the neighborhood, the roar of an engine, the squeal of wheels spinning against the dull or dark asphalt streets. At six and eight, this was our first adult toy. First unfettered and parental restraint. Our first choice to make our noise in the world, and boy, did we do it. Later that day, a neighbor came by, talked to our dad about paying the bill for the, for the damage we did to his teenage son's old wreck. After that, we got thoroughly strapped by dad's old belt, and that was the end of that. Yeah, great poem. Thanks for sharing that. Great, great sound, great yeah. rhyme and alliteration hidden in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mark. Oh. Yeah, that was uh, Mark Grinier with The Wreck of an Old Hot Rod. Um, next, let's go to Carolyn Codd. Hi, Carolyn. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Hi. Um, I'm not Hi. sure. I'm not sure if the connection is very, very good. But, yeah, you might want to, if you um, just uh, anyway, stop when video. when I heard the prompt, I push, thought right away about if you, Carolyn, if you, yeah, go there. Stop video, and that yeah, way think, that way we can hear you fine, yeah. but we just can't see it. Yeah. yeah, the sound, yeah. Yeah, much okay. better. Well, when I heard the prompt, I thought, I thought right away about my lemon tree. Aww. So this is um, springtime, in, springtime in lemon land. <laughs> it's spring. I look up lovingly at my lemon tree. She seems happy with her beautiful lemons shining in the light of <clears throat> in the light of the blue sky. I too am happy. But then some signs of sadness. A few of her branches are drooping. I too feel sad. 
We are also somewhat angry. This season, most of her delicious lemons will go to waste. They're quarantined by an almost invisible pest. So here we are, my lemon tree and I, sharing mixed emotions. At times the sun shines, other times clouds and rain. It's spring. Oh, beautiful poem, Carolyn. I've always wanted a lemon tree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's so fun looking out the window and seeing that, yeah. I bet. Yeah. It smells so good, too. Mm. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that little dose okay. of spring. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was Carolyn Codd with uh, Springtime in Lemonland. And next, let's go to um, uh, Janthi Rongan is here. Hi. Hi, Tim. Hi, Katie. Hi. No, I hope you guys had a good trip. We missed you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, really we definitely good. did. We went to Utah, mm -hmm. hiked a lot. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so th this week I wrote a prompt, um, the prompt poem, which is called Happy Birthday Aztec Rug. Hmm. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't know how to, uh, um, I don't know how to show you a picture of that, uh, <laughs> what we do with it. But anyway, this is, I'll just read the poem. But it has got um, two, a couple of words that are in Aztec. Hmm. Um, so please put up with me. <laughs> okay, no problem, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, happy birthday, Aztec rug. The floor cover is out on the patio for a spring bath with a bucket of water with soap bits in it. My kids slosh on the mat with bare feet. They scrape, squish, scream, and sashay. The yearly ritual is on with the area weave. It soaks in the tickling toes and the moist open air. Its woolly fur gets a massage in the backyard spa. It hums and groans with us and grins off-white. For drying, we all hold the edges of the rana and then a work song begins. Chippahua clean, Chippahua clean. God, she peetotek, she peetotek. This namda, Praise for a fresh skin, fresh skin. With a firm drag, it's on the railing for drips. The Aztec rug would have it no other way. Thirteen-year-old and the ritual stays. After the party, it's stainless and drippy. Of course, the gala has weather input nights with rain for an extra rinse by the next sun the carpet is newborn chipahua a family ritual of tidy with a wrap of renewed skin how fascinating details in that yeah i love the aztec thanks so much for sharing that happy birthday aztec rug <laughs> Gianti, thanks Gianti. thank you yeah there's Janthi rangan and uh, next um Let's see. It says Ar Aurora Borealis Ben Bar. <laughs> Let's see who that is. Are you there? Let's see. We're asking to unmute. Ben Bar, I think. Can you yeah. hear me? I can. Hello. Yes. Good to see Hi. you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no problem at all. I don't all. know what was going on. Uh, anyway, I, I wrote a poem uh, a few weeks ago, uh, inspired by someone on here. I think it's Dick Weisheimer. Westheimer, Westheimer. yeah. Mm -hmm. Westheimer. Yeah. Westheimer. He and you were doing the Sestinas, and uh, this isn't a Sestina. You might call it a little bit of a spring poem only because it deals with creation in, in a bit. Uh, but uh, I was inspired by it, and I thought that uh, 
maybe I would would share it if you don't mind. Yeah, definitely. That's Sounds great. really interesting. Yeah. Let's hear it. In the beginning. Go back in time to a time when there was no time, time before time, when nothing existed, nothing that we can see, hear, feel, touch, or smell. There was no earth, no moon, no star. Off in the far distance, a whole universe away from where the Milky Way shines in the moonless sky. No, there was no earth or universe even then. Scientists often say that before the Big Bang, four elements, the foundation of all the worlds, planets, stars, and no Mars, it was simply the gods, or was it just one god? Michelangelo's finger in the Sistine Chapel, the creation of the universe, world, and man, long before Adam and Eve in Genesis, when God created in a mere six days, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. From this comes all other matter, from the God that was already there. Um, was, yeah, William Garrett, thanks so much for sharing that poem. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the biggest, most spring of spring possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the first spring. <laughs> the first spring. The original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, my, my pseudonym is William Garrett as, as a poet. Get you. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, William. It was great. You're welcome. Yep. Hope you come back again soon, yeah. too. Yeah. Right, yeah. William Garrett um, with, uh, with uh, In the Beginning. All right. And next in line, we have Rob Harris. A few more poets left. Hello. Hey, Rob. Hi. Hey, how are you? Yeah, great. Good, Good to, to see you. you. Um, I wanted to share my... Uh regard for the word highfalutin from a few poems. <laughs> Yay, highfalutin <laughs> fan as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I wrote mine based on uh, travels. Uh, last weekend I was, or not last weekend, but the weekend before last, I was in Washington, D.C. and for the ch uh, cherry blooms. Hmm. And uh, if, if, you, if the people watching have never been there, I'm going to urge everyone to go see it if you can, because it's just, it's... Uh, insane how beautiful everything is there with the yeah and everybody should watch. look at the the golden haiku trail too yeah which is a lot of fun. over there in dc i got to see the I tail see end a of couple it. of those yes mm -hmm. um but um so the springtime part was uh pretty came pretty uh easy for me uh i did add some some art to this just for the benefit i, I hope at least some of the people here have seen the statue that i'm referring uh or the uh, king memorial um mm -hmm. But in case not, I, I uh, added it. So um, if it's distracting, I apologize, but I think it helps to make my point. And no, it's great. It's and a great. great sculpture, too. I love that yeah. uh, unfinished. Yeah. yeah. It, it takes on a whole new meaning, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at with this. It's called um, American Stare Down. Hmm. Uh, it goes like this. The tidal basin in our nation's capital acts as a shimmering backdrop for an epic American stare down. On one side stands Thomas Jefferson, holding in his left hand the Declaration of Independence, his intellectual tour de force. While Jefferson's mastery of language is beyond any dispute, his mastery of human beings is not nearly as celebrated. Standing on the other side is Martin Luther King Jr., whose left hand holds Jefferson's Declaration, if that's what you decide it is. King glares in Jefferson's direction to remind us all of the yawning gap between idealistic words and barbaric deeds. As travelers from around the world take their selfies among the cherry blossoms, the stare down plays out for those who choose to see it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And, uh, Great photo too. It really is something to see because King, you know, he's he's gazing into the distance, but he's looking right across the the basin at the Jefferson Memorial. I mean, the mm -hmm. the um, significance of it couldn't be missed, at least not by me. And yeah. uh, so, if you wonder what he's staring at. I I think anyway, he's staring in Jefferson's direction, saying, what are you talking about? All men are created equal. So uh, it took on a whole new meaning for me, and uh, that's, that's kind of what inspired me to write this. Yeah, so, well, wow. yeah, yeah, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Rob. Thank you for uh, letting me read it. I appreciate it. It was Rob oh, Harris. And, uh, next, uh -huh. next week, uh, going to see the uh, eclipse of the sun. So. Um, ah. 
that might end up in something. <laughs> well, sounds good. Well, that's a good segue for that's something we're going to say at the end, yeah. which is that oh. we're going to try to see the eclipse too, and yeah. we're gonna we're not going to be here on the show's going to be on Tuesday instead of Monday. Mm-hmm. Because both, um, you know, we want to get, get some good eclipse viewing if possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and weirdly enough, it's passing right by here and also right over next week's guest house, too. So, <laughs> oh, cool. so well, that'll give us all time to sort of uh, digest it a little bit and maybe, maybe do yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, thanks, sorry, Rob. Sorry to jump the gun on that. But, but, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we appreciate Always a good segue. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. As a Rob Harris with American Stare Down. And next we have um, Mary Lisa the Dominicious. Hi. Hi. How is everybody tonight? We're great. Good. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm good too. Really happy to be here. And I just want to um, thank you guys for all these wonderful prompts. I'm writing so much more because of them. Oh, that's oh, great that's to hear. Great. That's always that's the, the goal. Whole point. Yep, Yay. It is. <laughs> really great. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, a few prompts behind whatever. Um, but like to have a poem almost every week is extraordinary. So mm-hmm. yeah, for it me, does it feel is. good. It, it does. Good. It does. It really <laughs> does. Okay, so um, mine is from last week's prompt, and it's what the vintage doll said. Oh, and yeah. I did, I did send a um, a photo. Yeah, we uh, have it right here. Oh um, wow! Yeah. And then my my. Yeah, my cat um, <laughs> photobombed it. Yeah, that's perfect, oh, That's though. a great picture. It is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what the vintage doll said. Why she saved me, packed me away, to be returned to you later, after you'd grown, I'll never know. But here I sit, a curio in your cabinet. Same blue and white dress I donned when you were five and your mom brought me home to you. I'd keep you occupied, she thought, but you tired of me that same night. When she said I could walk, you believed I could walk on my own, but you had to move my right leg for my left to follow, over and over, a repetitive motion with no goal, an empty exercise on how to waste time, a bore. So when I went missing, layered into a cardboard box between thin sheets of paper with your other first things, baby shoes, blanket, christening gown. You didn't even notice I was gone. Yet here I am nearly 50 years later in the half shade of your dining room, behind a plate of glass with books you cherish and etched crystal goblets you never drink from. Why not pack us all away? We trinkets from your past lives. Why not donate or trash us? How can you stand to look at me, let alone display me? A constant reminder, once you were loved for simply existing, once you were loved enough. Oh, it's heartbreaking poem, What the Vintage Doll Said from a prompt a couple weeks Mm -hmm. ago. And there's the doll too, Mm -hmm. and the cat as well. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mary Lisa. Uh, Thank thank you for giving me the space to share and, and everyone. Giving everybody the space. It's it's really Aww. nice. Okay. Aww. Good night. Thanks so Thank much. You. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Mary Lisa D. Dominicious with uh, what the vintage doll said. Okay. A couple more people left in line. I saw Nivy. Oh, she might have had to go. Oh no. What did I do? Okay. That's better. <laughs> I I double clicked <laughs> a little too fast. Okay. Let's go instead to Jared Campbell. Sorry, Nivy. I saw you just at the last minute before. Aww. We probably missed her. But maybe she yeah. sent her poem and you can read it. Yeah. Hey, well, Jared, good to see you. Good to see you. Yep. So what have you got for us today? Um, yeah, so I just called it spring. Oh, and a great photo, too. Oh, this is mm-hmm. really interesting. I like this photo. Yeah, well, it's, it's cause the, you know, if you haven't seen it, it it's kind of hard to imagine when they're, so on the left there um, is the, the prairie that has not burned recently and oh so is that what that is okay mm-hmm. golden gray color but to the right um there's recently been a prairie fire and it's you you can't necessarily see a whole lot of it but the the the, the grass that's springing up from it is so vividly green mm-hmm. yeah that's it's, really fascinating picture possibly yeah. green it's thin but it's very very green mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's beautiful okay well let's hear the poem all right <clears throat> spring she is the scatter plot of withering white petals around the pear tree on the lawn 
She is the deep green of new shoots shivering, sparse as a newborn's hair, emerging from the black memory of the prairie fire, the richness that remains from last year's growth. She is the dead nettle, the purple cloak that uninvited glorifies the wheat fields, that doesn't pay, that doesn't yield, that doesn't care to be modestly embarrassed to outshine the golden harvest we will work for. She is the smell of rain, being absorbed by saturated earth, a disappearance, a mystery of what is yet to come. Yeah, very great poem and really fascinating photo yeah, that combination. Really is. Yeah. I would not have known that that's what that was. So I learned something too. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what we were looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Thanks, Jared. All right. Thank you. Yep, Thanks. Take care. Yeah, Jared Campbell with Spring. And uh, let's go to back. Nimmy's back. Yay. We didn't miss you. <laughs> Hi, Nivy. Hey, Jen. Hey, Katie. How are you doing? Hi. Good. How are you? Doing good. Thank you. Yeah, glad we didn't miss you. So uh, what do you have to share? It looks like a hyben. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. The hyben about spring. Oh, great. Um, it's sort of written from the point of view of a daffodil. Mm-hmm. So Aww. sort of a personification of a daffodil, how a daffodil kind of views spring maybe. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, let's hear it. The signal of spring. Amid the stillness of dawn, I emerge from my long and deep slumber. The soft rays of the morning sun embrace my golden petals, gently coaxing me to bloom. In the tranquil embrace of this still morning, I sway gently, a solitary sentinel of spring. Every petal of mine that unfurls is a verse in nature's poem. Each gust of wind that moves me a stanza in the symphony of life. It is to these gentle whispers of the wind that I dance. In harmony with the rhythm of the seasons, I am a haiku of hope, clinging strong despite the ever-changing landscape. From the soil's warm embrace, I emerge golden and bold, whispering the call of the new. Oh, I love the haiku of hope. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Nivy. I love haiku of hope, yeah. Yeah. That's what I want to be. (laughs) Uh, Thank you. I think that's what we all hope to be. Oh, and aim that's to very be. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. we reach there. <laughs> <laughs> said, well, thanks, Nivy. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Yep. Thank have you. a good day. Thank that's you. Nivy did Karthik with a signal of spring. And um, let's see. Next up, we have Lucy Chow. Hello. Hi, Lucy. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Um, it's a lot of like high bond today and a lot of plan personification today. Uh-huh. And I think I have both. I have a high bond and I personify a plan. Which oh. Yeah, it's a little bit long, but um I kind of love it and it's it's lovely here in Berkeley and I think I invoke some of that that joy in that poem oh that's great right. yeah and i you're another poet that i was wondering um you know if we'd have something really interesting with all the botany that you love to go right. to for spring yeah. so yeah let's hear it yeah so this is called rosemary strong woman for remembrance elder rosemary we remember you robed in turquoise and malachite sun and thunder showers We kneel before your altar of the four elements. For air, wild turkey tail feather and beadwork rainbow hummingbird. For fire, rose candle and sparkling rose quartz crystals. For water, a circle of scallop, coral, nautilus and periwinkle. For earth, strong, grounding, cooling and calming, you. A sprig, shiny as if oiled. Earth green, praying, fingers, flower, ultramarine, birds. Elder Rosemary, we remember you. You follow us into celebration of elms, pale green garlands, and sycamores, crimson tassels. You guard the gardens of strong women, young and fresh. Your energy is pure and clear, svelte and sweet, pale gold. A week's drying, 
and ripening gives you a honey tan and slight bitter taste. Years mellow you into mahogany amber, a deep, rich fragrance that's still perfectly translucent. You grow over time, and we cherish your wisdom. In little blue paper cups, we sip your spiritual growth. Kissed by green teeth, shards of pain in his spine grow whole. Elder Rosemary, we remember you. In your incense rising interfused with your sweet sister, Lavender, we inhale men of what was buried deep in the rhizosphere and fossil layers of ourselves. Inhaling you, we exhale knowledge of ourselves. We pray to the charred star in the burner. Breathing thrice, we pray to you. Potent uniter of winds breathes from the four directions. Elder winter of the mind, child spring of the spirit, youth summer of the body, adult autumn of the heart. Yours the Sarah spirals connecting Father Sky and Mother Earth. Breathing once, you bless and heal us. Breathing twice, you murmur benison to those we love. Breathing thrice, you mingle powerful potions of harmony for the cosmic family. You work to help i circulate throughout our convivial universe. Who learns happily with this teacher? Potatoes and chia seeds. What she knows, everyone knows and doesn't know. How to ask and be answered beyond that nice first sniff of shampoo and dish soap. Can she be loved whole? Elder Rosemary, we embrace you. We hope to be made whole by what you've made from the medicine wheel. You cool febrile temples and boost the brain's blood flow. Our thoughts and remembrance are convoluted, are convoluted groves of trees and tendrils, and you perfuse each twig to promote healthy growth. Your charisma defend us against the dark arts, cancer cells, free radicals, leukemia, and dementia. Rosemary, we rejoice in you. You are every morning's revival and every night's replenishment. Your aroma is rejuvenation. Little she sitting in earthen pot, a gift of grace. Elder Rosemary, we yearn to flourish with you, in you, for you. walking today from this garden into their own garden, wearing your pottery abode on their shoulder or holding your home in both hands into their home. At pick 17 in Jen, your dear friend whose rays drew from seed says today 17 is lucky. I shall be blessed with you. Little she pulsing in earth pot palpably. Elder Rosemary, I yearn to nurture and be nurtured by you. Elder Rosemary, I rejoice to be blessed by you. Elder Rosemary, I bow before you. I place you in my satchel, endeavoring to guard you with all my care, yet you are the stronger woman. I walk out of the canvas shade into a meadow of flowering grasses and ceanothus shrubs opening my whole self to the winds that bend and blow, cloud shadows that fold and unfold. Older Rosemary from the far end of the fields, should I, feeling your care for me, be trusted with caring for you? But I don't have a garden. The garden in my brain is intended by a woman strong enough to merit your regard. The skimpy balcony of apartment 514 is all I have to give you. Sergeanting here, should I plant the land with remembrance? Elder Rosemary, I will remember you. Today you are a little she, a child vibrating with vernal energy. I say to Julie, an older, stronger woman who has gardened her long time home on this land, a woman who knows how to love elders. I believe she would love to be in your garden. Time's wheel shall turn. Remember all elders it nurtures. 
Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Lucy. Really interesting use of uh, both the hyben and the tanka prose form. Yeah, thank you. It's, yeah. it's interesting to play with all of that. Yeah, it definitely is. And, and really interesting uh, you personifying the uh, herbs, too. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah, that was Lucy Chow with Rosemary, Strong Woman for Remembrance. And that is going to wrap up the Zoom. Let's see. Um, do we have any more we want to read really quick? We have a... Yeah, let's see. Let's do this uh, Jerry Krajnik. I, I saw Jerry somewhere. I remember that that name. So let's uh, let's read Jerry's poem. Why don't we? This is a spring poem by Jerry Krajnak. Here you go. Spring poem. Raindrops dance with barefoot children on suburban walkways, nudge roots of tulips to send shoots skyward. A season when poets and teens and tanagers all sing of juice and joy. Drops tap as well on the rooftops of sleepy earthworms, persuade them to stretch, to come out and play in the wetness and warmth where they are gobbled by robins who feed them to their babies, closely watched by bobcats and hawks. Mm. Ooh, the whole the cycle turn. of life there, yeah. yeah. Spring poem by mm. Jerry Krajnak. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jerry. And um, I think we have another, uh, another one we'll Guevara. share, too. Oh, Ted Guevara, yeah. too. Yeah, we have a few. Let's do this. So Ted Guevara's here. Okay. He's got a fascinating photo. Mm-hmm. This looks like um, some, what would you call that, Katie? Is that some lichen and then some? I would say it's not actually super tiny mushrooms, <laughs> but it looks like super tiny microscopic yellow mushrooms. Well, maybe, on a maybe branch. that's what it maybe is. Maybe it is, but I'm so bad <laughs> with stuff like that that I assume I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here we go. This is uh, Ted Guevara's poem. Um, life, lichen, I got Yay! it, nailed it, nailed it. <laughs> life with li- worth lichen. It's a great title. <laughs> <laughs> That's very punny. Yeah. Life worth lichen. <laughs> I get bullied a lot, but I'm the first one in class. Aww. I sit anywhere. I have no shame because for me, there's no hiding in hideous, and that could be translated to bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> and girls, the girls, and and the girls will melt. Sorry, my scaly hair. They long to touch, soft, cranial. I give them attention. I give them a scare. I'd say I'm chlorophyll potent, baby. (laughs) The sun is my bro, my link to your assurant eyes. Fear not my disease, for it ain't social. Symbiotic, mutualistic, I always drive top down. (laughs) Psoriasis, I'm not. Those are lowlifes in need to pick on grubs. Not this cool fungi. Fungi, nice. <laughs> he Ending went there. with the pun, yeah. He did go there that with a fun, fun guy. I okay, enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> Thanks so much. Just a little photo again. Yeah. Um, that was Ted Bernal Guevara. Thanks so much, Ted. Always a pleasure seeing what you've come up with. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's do these two. So uh, Dr. Q mm-hmm. was here as well. I guess had trouble with Zoom, in, Zoom, but is here and really wants to share poems. So let's do that. Uh, let me make it a little bigger so we can actually see it. Okay. Okay, so this is um, Primavera's Dance Partners. Um, and then here, let's, we'll do this. I choose to use Italian, the Italian word primavera for spring for romantic bias, as the English word spring tends to fall flat in the verses dances have been italicized. Songs are in quotes. Okay, uh, here's Primavera's Dance Partners. Saying goodbye, but still twirling with winter, although at times he reps himself as sprinter. He surely is the coldest gent she will hope to meet at this event. He blasts his way onto the dance floor, he with his winds and arctic chill, and as a handsome fella under the brightest beacon of Capella. His breath, a cool whisper with a side of sass, a touch converging on Primavera's soul like frosted glass. But in a fleeting, fleeting moment, he offers her a strange warmth in his icy ways beneath the moon's celestial gaze. He shakes a leg in the land of a thousand dances with a mashed potato t- transitions to walk like an Egyptian. He makes Primavera's head spin, too much of a contradiction. Winter takes a bow and departs in a flurry of snow, reminding Primavera that she has pretty plants to grow. So Primavera struts her stuff unaccompanied on the surface of the earth, gifting balmy rains and soft breezes upon the soils. Let's see what births. Primavera's sending sunlight to the blobs and seeds as petals unfold, so elegant bees abuzz and birds chirping cheery songs in glorious sentiment. Nature quick steps in vibrant shades of energy and hope in the vigilant care of Primavera's ardent scope. 
Primavera, with a smile and verdant glowing gown, waltzes onto the center stage, adorned with her flower crown. Primavera casts a stealthy look, a shy smile so bright, dancing cha-cha-cha on the earth, bathed in light. With a shuffling sound and a one-two-three, she is a blossoming show. Lingering, longing for summer, the hottest man to know. Shoulder to shoulder with summer in Roomba rhythm, Primavera wiggles with hips and ribs flowing with him. Summer and Primavera moving slow, moving fast and slow, melting into one another with a pleasing and friendly flow. Together dancing, two seasons merging in staccato beat, Primavera and summer, they've turned up the heat. Their movements fluid, intricate, expressive in a dance that has begun with marambas, and Morocco's, spotlighting them in the sun. Primavera murmurs in our ear, I'll see you another year, but not with them once again. We explore a fresh frontier. It's very interesting. That was uh, Primavera's Dance Partners by Dr. Q. Thanks, Dr. Q. And um, hopefully with the Zoom working at some point. Um, let's go, if one more, and why don't do it? Gail Henman is here. And um, this is really interesting. So... Hmm. I'm not sure what this is. This is very interesting. That looks like a detail of different types of stitches. Ah, yeah. very good. It's very guy. funny because I'm about to have to sew for the first time in a long time. And... <laughs> that is. Well, these yeah. are these are fan. I did not know stitching I, was that complicated. If I could make those stitches, I'd be doing it all the time. The Algerian eye stitch. It looks amazing. Wow. Yeah, the antique seam stitch. Wow. The Antwerp edging stitch. Oh my gosh. Wow. This That's is amazing. Fat. Yeah, th- I yeah. did not. This I did not know this existed. Okay, there's a little haikuish type poem at the bottom. My grandmother's vocabulary. She had so many nuances, stitches, and notions. For Victoria. Oh, that's sweet. And, and I love that the stitches are fascinating. Yeah, they are. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Gail. That was uh, Gail Hemmen with um, um, that, my grandmother's vocabulary. And that's going to wrap up the uh, open lines for today. And uh, or the prompt lines. I'm sorry. It's still. It's like been nine <laughs> months, have, yeah. almost a year. You're There's doing no good. Excuse. You're like you're like at ninety percent now. Ninety percent. We're proud of you. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> so that wraps up the prompt lines. Let's do the psyku really quickly. And the psyku this week is based on this story. Um, it is from, like there. <laughs> Let me click there. Okay. It is from um, Trinity College Dublin. And this was interesting. I had trouble like figuring out how to make it a haiku, but I thought this story was so fascinating. So here's the, uh, here's the headline. Genetic secrets from 4,000-year-old teeth illuminate the impact of changing human diets over centuries. And so apparently because um, all the bacteria in your teeth, like you think you could like learn a lot. How dare you? Yes. No, <laughs> <laughs> you can learn a lot by people's diets by uh-huh. like examining that. But it turned out they're sort of, they release a lot of acids, so don't really fossilize well. Mm-hmm. Really hard to find. And mm-hmm. there happened to be this, um, you know, this body, human remains, four thousand years old, um, where that was well preserved. So they mm-hmm. looked at different teeth dating back four thousand mm-hmm. years, and they found that there was more. Get this: there was more genetic variation um, in oh, what's the word for this? This is. Um, it's a Tannerella forsythia. That's the type of bacteria that, co- that contributes to gum disease. Ooh, okay. But there was more variation in the genotype mm-hmm. of that bacteria, different strains, in two teeth from the same mouth than there are in all the teeth in the entire world that they've studied. What? From samples as far away as like from the UK, US, and Japan, mm-hmm. we have less genetic variation mm. in the entire planet than in this guy's mouth. That's quite a mouth. And he has. so the theory has something to do with um, the industrial revolution, and you need uh-huh. more sugars and stuff. Uh. And maybe there's some kind of evolutionary advantage that this kind of uh, bacteria mm-hmm. had. Mm-hmm. But really fascinating how you never think of like the biome on the film of your teeth, but yeah. It looks but, like when you're brushing your teeth, trying to get rid of that bio. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what you do, and that's why you have to brush twice a day to yeah. let that bacteria not grow. And let that be a lesson to you, kids. There you go, kids. That is the point. <laughs> brushing twice a day, or you'll look like this guy from Kilora Cave. Um, <laughs> you'll have a lot of different varieties of S mutans. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway. <laughs> So that is this article. But that was really strange, though. That is. That's interesting. And uh, here's a little psyku about this. Let me get it on the screen. The psyku was surviving by the skin of his teeth, bacterium. <laughs> I think <laughs> he would appreciate that. I think he would. <laughs> so there you go. That is the psyku for this week. And that is the show for this week. Next week's prompt 
is going to be. Do you know what the next week's prep is going to be, Katie? Or do you have to read it on the screen? Uh, I believe, I know what, okay, yes, thank you. There it is. Write a poem with internal rhyme in every line. So this came up a lot, actually, in the prompt lines tonight, but we're ready to do it again. We are. We're going to talk about um, the music with Wendy Wendy Vitalock on Mm -hmm. the Poetry Space this Mm -hmm. week. We thought it'd be fun to uh, get some musical... Uh, musical poems going yeah. with internal rhyme. Right. So there's one poem, um, there's a sonnet form in our sonnet issue that this made me think of mm-hmm. because um, it had, and the rhyme scheme was there was internal rhyme in each mm-hmm. line, mm-hmm. basically. That's and it's, nice. um, oh, I can't remember how it goes or who it's by. Mm-hmm. But anyway, you should look that up. <laughs> I'll get right on that. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah. So that is the uh, prompt for next week. Write a uh, poem with internal rhyme in every line, yeah. at least one. So that is the prompt for this week. And next week's guest is going to be... Oh, I'm very excited for next week's guest. George Bilgier! Yay! Yay! George Bilgier comes back. He uh, He's a great guest, really fun guy. And speaking of fun guy, <laughs> and, uh, I think it was stuck in my brain. And, um, you know, he won the Rattle Chapik Prize last year for one of the three winners for Cheap Motels of Our Youth, which all subscribers are getting to enjoy right now. So we'll see what George has been up to since he was on back in Rattlecast 38. I just mm-hmm. made that up. I don't really look at the number, but it's something like 38. <laughs> <laughs> you can scroll back to find George Bilzier. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, but the important note, note that day, Tuesday, April 9th, mm-hmm. like we were talking about with Rob, we want to see the eclipse and you have to drive a little bit. We're not sure where the, in, the way traffic is. Mm-hmm. We might not be able to get back in time for the Rattlecast. Mm-hmm. So just to be safe, we're going to move it up a day to April 9th for mm-hmm. just this one week. Uh, to have George Bilgier on, and, and it's flying right over Cleveland, too, where George famously lives. He likes to make fun of Cleveland <laughs> yeah, a lot. He does. <laughs> but uh, But he'll be enjoying that eclipse. Maybe he'll, we'll talk about that, too. Mm-hmm. Or maybe we'll just talk about the clouds that were in the way. Um, yeah. Either way, there's a poem in there somewhere, guys. There you definitely know, is. There is. Yep, that's next week's guest, George <laughs> Bilgier, Rattlecast number 240. Tuesday, April 9th, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, though, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week. In the meantime, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.